Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Woking and Borough Council Planning Committee. We do have a, a PA system. Mobile phones should be on off or on silent. And there isn't a fire drill plan tonight. The proceedings are filmed, as you can see, and will be available on the Woking and Borough website. You'll see from the current position that committee members, council officers and registered speakers will normally be recorded. But speakers may ask not to be filmed, but their comments will be audio recorded. The planning committee is made up of nine elected members, and I will ask everyone to introduce themselves with their name and their ward, starting with my right. Councillor Angus Ross, representing Wilkie without me. Wayne Smith, member for Hurst. Michelle Shepherd Day, member for Wish. Malcolm Richards, member for Norwich in Wilkie and Chris Barry Evans, Ward in Wokingham, Kaishan. Tim Holton from Hawkland in Nair Early. Also representing London in Woodley. And I'm Carl Moore and representing Bolton Wales. Thank you very much, members. We are supported and advised by a variety of professional council officers. And now I'll ask them to introduce themselves, starting on my far right. Caroline Chapman Clark. Larry Sabin Gay League advice to the committee this evening. Thank you very much. And the planning officers presenting tonight's applications are sat at the side and I will introduce them at the appropriate time. This is a quasi-judicial committee with formal set procedures and conduct. Firstly, the planning officer will present each application. Then I will call in turn only those who are pre-registered to speak. Please come forward to the table. The microphone is controlled by the grey button on the base. The time limit of three minutes for each category of speaker will be strictly enforced. So please ensure you get your key points across within your allotted time. Members of the committee are interested in the quality of what you have to say and not for how long that you speak. Following the planning officer's presentation and the comments of registered speakers, the planning committee members will consider, question and seek clarification for the application and hopefully reach a decision which may or may not agree with the planning officer's recommendation. Finally, a reminder that the local planning authority's role is to determine any valid planning application using local and national planning policy. Our role is not to suggest alterations to schemes whether they are a good idea or indeed needed, whether they are too costly or whether there are alternative uses. Thank you very much, and I shall now move on to tonight's agenda. And the first item <coughs> is apologies, and I'll ask Madeline for any apologies. Thank you, Councillor Jarvis. Okay. Thank you very much. And then we move on to the minutes of the last. Yeah, not yet. We move on to the minutes. Are there any alterations to the meeting meet, meet, minutes? No. All those in favour then, please show. Thank you very much. That's unanimous. And don't we have anyone need to declare any interest? Michelle. As Winnish Ward Rep Councillor, I've helped some of the redesign of the relief, Winnish Relief Bill. However, I, will make, I have an open mind and will make a decision on the information that's provided to me tonight. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Are there any applications to be withdrawn? No, sure. Okay. All right, there's none to be withdrawn. We can move on to the first item then, which is agenda item 40 on page 13, which is the land at Arnett Avenue and Bark and Ride. It's a full application for 46 dwellings with associated parking and landscaping following demolition of the existing buildings. It's before the committee as it's a major application and the applicant is working on housing. Uh, the committee went on a site visit on Friday. I'll now hand over to the case officer, Nick Chancellor. Thank you very much, good evening, committee members. I'm here to present uh, this application, uh, Land of Time and Avenue and Welcome Ride. And the application relates to a one hectare site within Finch Hampstead and currently comprises seven existing bungalows and also um, Cocaine Court, which is an older person's extra housing facility that comprises 24 one-bedroom units. 
All of the units on the site, both the bungalows and all of the, those at Cochrane Court, are vacant. Vehicle access to the site is via Arnott Avenue. So the application is to demolish the 31 existing units and to replace these with 46 new homes. That's 10 houses and 36 flats. 43 of the 46 units are to be affordable housing, either social rented or shared ownership tenures. And this is considerably in excess of the policy requirement for affordable housing. And the reason for that is that this is specifically an affordable housing scheme, and the application is made by Waking Housing Limited. The houses, um, which we can see here in the top left part of the site, are all three bedroom, and they're sited, uh, and their car parking is provided in a courtyard area to the front of them. Um, the majority of the existing site trees in the rear gardens of these houses um, can be retained with the scheme. And all of the gardens meet or exceed council standards for depth. A new landscape pedestrian route would also be opened up to Bark and Ride, which provides the greater permeability for pedestrians, not only for this development, but also for those living nearby. And that's this section of the site here. So in terms of the apartments, there are 36 of them, and they're sited um, on the eastern half of the site, spread between two blocks, and they're orientated in an approximate north-south um, orientation. Now these are all either one or two bedroom apartments, and they're um, parallels in the design in terms of the materials and detailing uh, to the houses um, just adjacent to them. Now, all of the apartments meet the council standards for internal living space spaces. So, taking the westernmost of the apartment blocks, that's unit numbers 11 to 26. Uh, this block comprises 16 units. The third floor is um, well. There are three three floors of accommodation, and the third floor is accommodated within the roof space, um, and the block overall is. 10.3 meters to the roof ridge. This is uh, one, one meter taller than the three bedroom houses on the western half of the site. The apartments benefit from access to their own private shared amenity space to the west of the building, which you can see just here in the northwest corner of the picture. Uh, and there's also a village green space uh, just to, uh, again, to the west which is being retained as part of the development. Units uh, on the eastern apartment block, there are 20 of them, and um, as with the western block, there are three levels of accommodation, the third level also within the reef space. Similar design, very similar in terms of the materials and detailing, and again, they also benefit from shared amenity space to the east of the block which you can see here in the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, the uh, plan. The proposal includes 56 parking spaces overall, and this accords with the council's parking uh, standards that found in the MDD local the plan. Condition 12 would require the applicant to submit a car park management plan uh, for approval by officers. So taking all of the uh, accommodation, the houses and the flats, um, they're considered to be well designed and appropriately sited within the local context. In terms of their relationship to neighbouring properties um, on Finch Hampstead Road and Park and Ride, they all meet or exceed the council's guidance on separation distances. <clears throat> Although the new housing would be visible from neighbouring dwellings, it's not considered that there be any significant or harmful overlooking. And as previously mentioned, the apartment blocks do include three levels of accommodation. However, um, this can be thought of as two and a half storey, since the third level is within the roof space. 
uh, the increase in height <coughs> over the existing Cocaine Hall building is <coughs> just uh, 1.6 meters uh, additional. Many of the existing trees on the site, along the northern and western boundaries, uh, and eastern boundaries rather, have been retained in the layout. They're shown in three areas, the first two on, on this slide. Um, and then this is the village green area where um, there are existing trees which would be retained. A condition is also recommended which would require the applicant to submit a landscape plan for approval. And this is expected that this would include new additional tree planting as well as those that are being retained. So in summary, the proposal is considered to be good quality design that relates well to its surroundings. It will provide much needed affordable housing for various residents and is supported by the council's housing officers. The application is consistent with the council's policies and standards and there are no material considerations weighing against the proposal. Therefore, it's recommended for approval, subject to the conditions recommended. And then we just draw attention to a few things in the members' update. The first of which is the uh, recommendation itself. This is just a, a technicality. It changes the, the wording to planning obligation instead of unilateral undertaking. This is simply to change the method by which um, the um, contributions would be uh, to sign and sign would be secured. It's simply just a procedural matter. Uh, the second update is to working hours um, in light of the um, suburban nature of the site and its proximity to uh, neighboring residents. The um, working hours have been um, changed to, to have a start of no earlier than 8 a.m. on Monday to Friday, December 24th. Um, a new condition is also recommended on electric vehicle charging. This would require the applicant to submit a strategy for that um, prior to commencement into the development. And yes, those just changes to those conditions. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we have a number of registered speakers, and the first one is Roland Cundy, representing Finch Hampstead Parish Council. If you'd like to come forward, you can bring me. And the first words I'd like to say about this development, it's um, in the most deprived area of Finchampstead and it is most welcome, especially the affordable housing and the way that it has been presented tonight. There are some issues, of course, um, that we worried about, and particularly for the residents, and a large construction, demolition and reconstruction in an area which is heavily populated and thus cause the uh, <coughs> residents some concerns and they're particularly worried about that. And bearing in mind that this is the first phase in that area, there's going to be another couple of phases of where there is the whole regeneration of that area. So in particular, we would like to see this go as smoothly as possible. Um, I think you've seen the comments um, on page uh, 23 of what we're worried about. Uh, parking should be provided for on site contractors' vehicles. We're worried about the traffic management, uh, particularly in that area, the FBC on um, particular days is very busy and because of shortage of car parking spaces, there is traffic parking everywhere in that area. Um, and we, uh, so there's that element. There's also a bit about dust and that. So if I go through them, um, I see that you have a um, construction environment management plan, which I think covers most of the areas that are mentioned in that comments. Um, and it says um, on number 12, measures to inform local residents of the commencement of development by letter and provide appropriate contact details for residents to contact the developer if they have concerns or issues. We have um, uh, Jenny Green who is a community worker there and I'm in a community house. So I think that would be an ideal contact point in the centre should the people um, want to have issues and for the contractors and people doing the work there to address. Um, the, um, it is a pity because the, you were, there is a house you've got 
on Barkham Road, which could have been demolished and made the construction traffic rather than go up uh, uh, Gorse Road North, would go through that, that site, which would have saved a lot of trouble. And I noticed that I think you said there are a lot of mature trees there, and I'm not sure how many trees are there, because the uh, impact of all that heavy traffic, and let's say you've seen the buildings, how much is going there, you know how long it's going to take, demolition backwards and forwards, on a very tiny road with a 30 mile an hour limit, on it, um, which um, and it has an awful lot of residential traffic on it. So it's one of those areas I think is going to cause the biggest problems and the major issues for the residents there. Um, and that's about it really on that aspect. So we are pleased that it's going forward. The only thing is we want to make it go as smoothly as possible if you can, and do what you can, and revisit possibly the idea of coming through from Bark and Ride construction traffic rather than going up course right north. So I um, don't know if those people will be taken into consideration. But we do welcome this. Right. It's, uh, thank thank you very much. That's the time. Extremely simple. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. No big leaps. Right, next we have Arch Thompson and Carl Wilcox. Can I just ask how you're planning to share it? Are you speaking for the full three minutes or a minute and a half each? I'll speak first. Would you like the bell to go up for one minute, 30 when seconds? No, when I'm finished. Okay. So it's two minutes. Will the bell go up two minutes? Do you want it to go up two minutes? Yeah. It will go up two yeah. minutes. And neither of you want to be filmed, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Must I see that? Would you like to press the button in front of you? Sorry. That's it. Okay. Great. Mr Chairman and members of the committee, I believe the purpose of your committee is to ensure that you have all the information to hire to assess that it is accurate and not misleading before approving any application. I would therefore refer you to the information I received from the clerk in respect of what information has been provided to the committee in respect to the objections from the residents affected by this proposal. If you are not aware of the detail of these objections, you should not vote on this proposal until you are. Could you just move the mic a bit so it's facing you because people are struggling to hear you? Yeah, it's the accent. In respect, I would draw your attention to file 5089. Nick Chancellor's um, summary to the committee. Quote Nick says the development can be brought forward without having an unacceptable impact on the unity of existing residents integrating well with the neighbouring residential development. I totally agree with this, disagree with this statement. It is misleading and not representative of the residents' objections. It suggests we're all happy with the proposal, which we are not. There are significant issues in respect to this. Overlooking existing two-storey building with three storeys. This is a major issue and there are no other three-storey buildings in our area. My house and my neighbour's house must be the same height. Why therefore is this proposed building allowed to be much higher, resulting in an invasion of privacy? Existing building contains minimal small windows with no real overlooking problem. The new building, to the back of my property or our properties, has approximately 28 windows, 11 of door signs. This is an overlooking problem. Noise. The existing building is quiet and acceptable. The new building has 46 flat stroke houses, a potential of 184 people, plus cars, plus motorcycles, plus animals, etc. This is a major issue for the local residents. How can 184 people not generate more noise and be acceptable to the adjacent residents? Right, that is the two minutes. Okay, yes, Mr. Chancellor's summary to you is extremely general, but does not portray any detail of the residents' objections. I therefore believe that you, the committee, have not been fully made aware of all the residents' objections whose properties are adjacent to this proposal, which may reflect in the wrong decision being made. I would also like to ask you all to place yourselves in the position of the residents adjacent to this development. I, my house is your house, and reflect what decision you made. Final question to the committee. Have you all read the objections received from those of residents of Eddie? So um, just adding on to the Archer's point, um, so I live one of the houses backing on to the side of the eastern block, 
Um, so currently, the two-storey Cockaine Court is 12 metres from our boundary, uh, and the new development, the new three-storey property, is four metres from our boundary. So in terms of uh, the am amount to which we are overlooked, uh, and the reduction in sunlight, this has had a really major impact on us, as well as, as, as noise, um, infrastructure, uh, and, and property values. That's, that's, that's my thing. One last thing I'd like to say is that just looking at the uh, additional members update that was available tonight, um, ours have been reduced to be a clock to um, <coughs> six, six o'clock a week. You know, we've got to live with this for a period of months. Thank you. You've had your, your time, gentlemen. Okay, it was a small point, but I thought you were taking it. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next, we have Martin Gray, Living Architect. Welcome. Thank you. I am Martin Gray from Living Architects, and we are the architects working in this housing, with working in housing on this development. This proposal is for the demolition of the redundant Cook End Court care home in the adjacent bungalows for the building of 10 three bedroom houses and two blocks of one and two bedroom flats. A total of 46 dwellings are proposed. As you're aware, Working and Borough Council has made a decision recently to regenerate the Gorge Rides South Estate, as there were many issues related to the non traditional nature of these homes. This development will serve as the first part with letting and home ownership priority being given to the residents who will be affected by the wider estate regeneration. Cocaine Court was supported living scheme for older people that unfortunately does not meet modern day standards or space requirements for enhanced sheltered or extra care housing. Two new extra care housing schemes have opened in the borough in 2018, which have provided a greater choice of affordable homes for the residents to choose from for their relocation. For the proposals, the proposed buildings are a full two storeys with pitched rooms, with a block of flats having additional accommodation within the roof slope. The flats located in the roof slopes have dormer windows, which are a common feature of the adjacent Bark and Ride and Pink Hampstead Road properties. Overall, the height of the new development is approximately 1.6 metres higher than the ridge of the existing care home. This modest increase in ridge height allows for photovoltaic panels and other plants to be hidden within the roof well and to allow safe working access. The provision of the PV panels assists with achieving sustainability targets. To give the scheme a specific identity, we are proposing the traditional palette of materials with a modern twist. The brickwork has contemporary features and detail and incorporates gabled features adopted throughout the development. The materials proposed are brick with brick features, tiled rooms and engineered timber cladding. We have centred the design around a new village green, which will be available to the wider community. Our proposal documents include a full upper course of assessment, and the application includes a landscaping master plan which shows how we seek to enhance the landscaping in the area and retain a significant number of existing trees across the site. Car parking is proposed in excess of the council's minimum guidelines, which suggest a minimum of 35 spaces. We are proposing 57 spaces so as to minimise any potential for overspill parking into the wider area. We held a public consultation event near the site in March this year and approximately 20 residents attended. Following that consultation, we reduced the height and bulk of both flat blocks at the north and south ends of the blocks and reduced the number of first floor windows looking north towards the park and road properties. In addition, for the eastern flat block at the nearest Finchampstead Road, we have removed all of the balconies from the upper floors and have reduced the size of the windows facing the Finch Hampstead Grove properties. And additionally, we have increased the parking numbers and provided three standing cycle stores to the other side. Wind up, then, please. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. All right, our last registered speaker then is Councillor Simon Weeks, the ward member. Good evening to you. Good evening, members. Um, I'm speaking to you as ward member tonight. Um, as a child, I watched Gorse Ride built uh, because my family home is in Finchester Road, which is the area uh, where you've had some objections tonight. Um, I support the overview development of the Gorse Ride estate. 
Many of the homes were built using construction methods that were intended to last 25 or 30 years. The houses are now more than 50 years old and a very poor standard of accommodation. Equally, Cocaine Court no longer was fit for purpose and all the residents have moved to new care homes in the last three months. I do note the objections from some residents in Finchamsted Road and Bark and Ride. The main contention appears to be the height of the two blocks. Um, I would stress that, as has already been mentioned, there was a redesign of the scheme to incorporate the third floor within the roof space. So in essence, it's a two and a half storey building, a concept that is not that unusual in the borough. And as also was mentioned, it's 1.6 metres higher than the existing cocaine court. The distance between the Park and Ride houses, that's numbers 160 to 170B, uh, in all cases meets or exceeds the requirement for back-to-back -back distance or the distances between properties. I think there may be some confusion that this, this is measured between the facades of the buildings, not from the bound to the boundary fence. <coughs> so that indicates the level of potential overlooking from homes. The properties in Finchester Road, numbered 391 to 391, nine, their distances are well in excess of the 30 metre requirement and they range from 41 to 45 metres. Mature trees on the site or adjacent to the site are to be retained. Parking standards are met and I notice that the parish council hasn't raised any objections. There's an infrastructure contribution from the development which is intended to satisfy the increased demand and impact of the <coughs> development in terms of local facilities. I note that there's a construction and environment management plan which was always already referred to by the Parish Council. Um, that's often known as a SEMP. <coughs> I would request through you, Mr Chairman, that you and I as Ward Member have an involvement in the agreement of that final construction and environment management plan because it, as it, with many developments, it's the actual development stage that has the potential to cause the most harm and annoyance and upset and disturbance during the construction phase. I should like to be involved in that. I hope we'll give that due consideration. This is not a greenfield site. It's a well-established brownfield site and it's in need of enhancement and refurbishment. I understand the planning committee has visited the site and I support the recommendation that tonight's application should be approved. Thank you. Well done, I can see you used to be chairman. <laughs> Right, before I open it up to, um, to members, I'm just going to ask the officers to come back on some of those, all of those questions. So the first one I took note of was the construction management plan. So if I could have some comments on that parking on site, the traffic management and the dust. Um, and there was also the comment about could we have used park and ride construction traffic. I know we have to consider what we've got in front of us, but if you could just give us a comment on, on that. And then if you could move on to the overlooking and no other three stories in the area, the extra noise because of the extra number of people living there, and finally the change in the boundary from what previously was there is 12 metres and now it's down to, to 4 metres. Thank you. Uh, I was going to pick up on the, the Kemp um, construction market management plan. It, it is basic as it is a condition at the moment, which obviously Simon has made that recommendation, which we're happy with that, if that's something that you're happy to um, include. Um, in terms of the access arrangement for construction vehicles out of park and ride, um, it's not something that's part of the application as you mentioned, but I think it's probably worth just highlighting on the plan. You can see obviously in the top corner um, where obviously it would be a reference to. It's probably about 10 years wide, but it would result in the scrubbing of all of those trees. Uh, as I said, we haven't had a look at it, so we can't tell whether or not there's sufficient visibility at the entrance, whether it would be a one, wide enough for one vehicle or two vehicles, it's even two vehicles, it would be substantially um, scrubbing all of that uh, vegetation. Uh, but if it was only one lane thick, then clearly you've got the potential of vehicles waiting in the carriageway as it has to wait for someone to come out before it can enter. So uh, it, I think the scheme in front of us, it has an access, it's not it's not that much of a burden as far as we can see we've got the control of the construction management plan. Um, but that's not something that's in front of us we haven't unfortunately had a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, I would also just emphasize that were that corridor to be used for the construction access, it really would be a, a, a terrible shame given the high quality trees that are in that corridor. Um, one of the um, 
benefits of the scheme is, is opening up that corridor long term for um, pedestrian permeability and it will um, certainly greatly enhance the landscape of that corridor to, to have those trees retained in the, in the long, for the long term. Um, so to just address the question of noise, I think the uh, resident had uh, raised that um, was concerned that the, the number of new residents and their activities would, would lead to uh, an unacceptable or harmful level of noise. Um, I disagree. I, um, it, it's not unusual for an apartment block of this size to be located within this proximity of, uh, of neighbouring residents. And uh, it, it's not the case that um, having a, you know, people living in an apartment block will, will create um, noise nuisance. Um, so um, it's, it's not, uh, not, not a concern in terms of causing a harmful effect on neighbours. Um, his, um, his neighbour was, was uh, right to, uh, to mention that uh, the distance between the existing cocaine court uh, building and its boundary is being reduced, I think, I think he said 12 metres, it's down to I think it's four and a half metres. Um, certainly the distance to the boundary is um, at the level proposed, uh, four, four and a half metres, is, is acceptable um, as far as I'm concerned in terms of my reading of the um, borough design guide. Um, was, that, was that it? No. Okay. I shall open it up to members now. Who would like to go first? Michelle. A couple of small questions. <laughs> There's limited parking there. What bus access is available on the road? And second of all, could you show on the uh, diagram there where the four meters to the uh, is the resident we're talking about? Thank you. Four. Four point seven five. Is it to the house or just to the back door? Mm -hmm. To the boundary. How far is it to the house? Thirty meters. Bus access. Okay, Angus, then no, Malcolm. Bus access. Okay. No, what bus? What bus access is available since limited parking? You're assuming people are going to be taking the bus rather than driving. Uh, where is the nearest bus? Um, just. Just bring up the bus map now because I, I don't know the specific numbers of the bus routes that come out, but yeah. Mark and Ride has um, bus stops on it. Um, but just coming back to the point you made, it's not restricted or limited parking. It, it meets the parking standards that the council has in front of it. Um, the, the, the architect of the district mentioned is obviously a number 36. Uh, that's if it was all unallocated and it's not something that we're, we're supporting that allocate provision, therefore that's why there's the 56 bus spaces being provided which allows for a good provision of 36, 39, I think it is, allocated spaces, and then 18 visitor and unallocated, which complies nicely with the standard of purpose. It gives a good provision of unallocated uh, allocated as well. You know I like to see two parking spaces per dwelling. Oh, I say it means yeah. never space. Yeah. Uh, Angus? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, to, just to say, although I didn't attend the site visit with the rest of the committee, I have been to the site since myself. Um, one question I've got is, we're talking about minimising traffic, uh, construction traffic, and also our recycling policies. Is this site not big enough for the, the building materials from the existing buildings to be recycled or reused on the site? It's a question I've asked before. Um, whilst we think about that one, um, the uh, during my visit, it's a side issue, it's not a planning issue, but uh, I do hope the applicant will tidy the place up. I was appalled by the rubbish behind number 95 uh, left there, um, but that's not a planning issue. Um, parking along Arnett Avenue, uh, which the Chairman of the Parish Council raised, um, I think will be watching during construction, but it doesn't affect the very construction traffic, managing to get to the site. Um, but I think overall it's a good scheme. It applies to all our policies of distance. It's a great start to the re renewal of that area. So I'll just leave the question about recycling materials. Thank you, Angus. Um, yeah, so the site, I mean, clearly the site is, isn't the biggest uh, development site uh, going. and It's got a lot of existing trees on it. 
So you wouldn't want to stockpile any materials next to them because it would damage the roots and probably kill them in the future. Um, so in terms of how we would assess that, if that information we get as part of the construction environmental management plan, about how you're going to do it. Because until you actually get a contractor on board to start doing the work and the demolition and all that, you don't know how they're going to, how they're going to do that. But we will control that as part of the, the camp. I understand that. I've just asked that it is noted as, yeah, as a, that's an intent, if possible. Yes. Malcolm. Just two quick points. <coughs> um, one of them was about waste materials, the possibility of recycling, but you just answered that. Uh, another question is, uh, is there going to be a requirement for all the vehicles associated, both with the demolition and the construction, to be able to remain entirely within the site and not have to park at any time on any of the local roads? Because it's a residential area, roads are not massive, and people do park there. That's a point question. Uh, it's kind of a combined one between powers and planning, or obviously it's, it's a very hard one to police, mm -hmm. if we're being honest, um, subject to what's happening on site at that time. Um, and ideally, yes, we would work with them to secure the parking of vehicles on site during construction. Yeah. Demolition, my understanding is that can actually take place without planning permission, but Colin can obviously elaborate uh, yeah. that as he did. But it's a uh, work that has needed, and it's something that I'm sure we could work with them to try and achieve the best we can for the residents of the area. Next question is, is it a big thing? Uh, he mentions there that there is a, is it Kemp, I don't know how you would pronounce it, uh, a Kemp plan for uh, vehicles during the construction phase, but not during the demolition. Um, and so during the demolition, it's quite possible then that uh, the vehicles associated with carrying waste or any place could be going around any sort of road they want without having any sort of plan. Uh, is that the point you're making, that you intend to in agree something though before they... Yeah, I think in any case, on any site, there's demolition involved, um, so you can demolish yeah. without, without having to treat necessary plant permission and things like that. But in, in terms of um, the road route, in terms road. of the routes, because it's one because it's council road, two because there is demolition, um, we would want to be engaged with the developers who are us basically um, about how that would work. So we, we definitely have some. We realise the sensitivities because it is a constrained site; it's within the <coughs> existing area. So it's something we will want to manage as we go forward. It's probably just worth pointing out as well, it's not related to this scheme, but Phoenix Avenue, obviously in North Oakham, is an area that is very similar to this in terms of its constrained nature in the residential area. And my understanding is that's pretty much gone quite well in accordance to plan. We haven't had many issues with the construction management plan in that location. This is a fairly simple one. Uh, I'll try to add up the numbers. It's apparently 31 properties being demolished and 46 being built, which is quite a good increase. But looking at the numbers that were on, I think, maybe page 27, I couldn't uh, reconcile, I couldn't get 31 out of them. I could get a, a range of different numbers, depending on whether you counted odd number properties or the whole of the list. But um, Nick was going to find out, uh, is it 31 and not 33 or 35 properties? Did you, did you find that? Uh, yes, I did, and I can confirm that it is indeed 31 properties in total to be demolished. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, a slightly amusing point on page 27 where it describes what's going to be built. Um, it says there are going to be, I think, my on several written here, please. Sorry. 17 one bedroom flats, 18 no bedroom flats. I think they missed out the number two. <laughs> they won't be very popular. Uh, and then some three bedroom flats and many houses. So that's a, a typo, really. Um, obviously, with that number of dwellings, I was concerned about the parking levels, but you say it meets the standards. Okay. And the last point is, uh, will there be a right to buy option retained on, the, on these properties? Or, because obviously if they have a right to buy at a reduced rate, it takes the availability out of affordability. It's likely to be removed from this. It's, um, it's not a planning matter, actually, so um, not, not for consideration. Okay. Thank you. Wait. A uh, number, number of questions, um, looking at the objection from the neighbours, can you just tell me, Nick, what the density is of the site? That's the first thing. Um, why are you looking at that? I see that um, they all are within the borough design guide with a separation distance of 30 metres. Can you just remind us of what the 
what the appropriate design guide is for the property backing on to 170A. It's 4.75, but you said you were confident that it met the borough design guide. What is the borough guide design guide for that? So, the, um, I believe it's two metres to the boundary um, would be the, the absolute minimum in the borough design guide from, from the flank wall to the boundary. But 30 metres I refer to is, is from the flank wall yeah. of the apartment to the flank wall of the name. And that's on page 29. Mm -hmm. And while you're looking up density, um, I, hear what the, sorry, I hear what the parish council is saying about the entrance onto Bark and Rye. I would wonder what the conversation would be with neighbours of, of the houses of 162 and 168. Um, although it is an obvious route, you're going to lose a lot of trees. Although I do share the concerns of the parish council, having went there on Friday, and we were behind the, the bin lorry, um, Friday definitely is one that's going to be congested. Um, but I do think that if what was proposed by Simon, the ward member, and what's just started in Hurst on not as big a development, but equally a very tight development in a very tight set of narrow lanes, we've met the construction manager and the site manager and so far so good, we've engaged the local school, so I would certainly recommend that. On the basis that I don't think that it would be a neighbourly option, um, and I don't know if you've actually discounted the option of moving into Barkham Road. I know you said you don't favour cutting those trees down, but if the construction management plan hasn't been finalised yet, is that still an option, or are we saying tonight that isn't, that isn't an option? And I've just obviously it's something that hasn't formed part of the application, so it's not been looked at. But I've just had a quick look at it now, and actually where that section of land is, there is just obviously on the park and ride, there is a, a, a full signalised pedestrian crossing. Now, in itself, that would be quite a significant piece of equipment that would need to be relocated. You'd need to find a location where you need to relocate it to, so it, all of a sudden it becomes a much bigger task than potentially just considering it here. And it's, it, Personally, I don't think it's something that would be no, I'm, option, I'm certainly not voting for it. I'm just saying that the parish council said it would have been a good suggestion, but if we were thinking of that, you'd certainly have to engage the neighbours because I wouldn't want those lorries to go and pass my ball. I think also if you actually look at it, just have a look at it, and you, you would actually take a substantial amount of frontage out, including the neighbours' fences and frontages. So it's not an easy option. Okay. Uh, and uh, oh, sorry, density. Next is yes. oh, yes. well, they should be too. It's uh, forty-five to the hectare. I was just going to show you the start. It's the number three bus that goes along. Thank you. I was going to add the same. It's got twenty-minute frequency during peak hours and Saturdays. No. Yeah, uh, just looking at the plan on the three-story buildings. I notice at the end of each building there is an area for for waste. I think bearing in mind the distance uh, the people are walking with their waste to use those bins, is there sufficient bins there for a start? And bearing in mind that come April we're going to have food waste as well, is this going to be sufficient and workable? It's a rather small bin area, and I'm thinking, you know, uh, where do they store their rubbish until they get to the, the bins? Uh, well, the, the distance between the bin area and where the flats are is within the standard, so we, we obviously have to meet a certain standard in terms of walking distance to carry distances. Um, in terms of the size of the unit, the bin units, refuse units themselves, um, I have to say I don't know if they're sufficient for future um, change to the, the refuse. Um, they're probably designed on uh, this uh, standard, but I mean, looking at them, there's a, there is a degree of flexibility to increase the size of the bin to anyway. Uh, it might be a, a further application in terms of small extensions of that. Uh, but there was a lot of um, debate about where they go. Um, we put them in the place that we thought was the best place for them. Um, so that there has been thought into that, but I, I don't know the answer to if there's sufficient space for the future. I don't know if Nick, you can do you know anything? No, no, nothing further to add. Is it something that we should be looking into, considering April is the time that food waste is well, coming? 
our, our current standard doesn't require it until we change. Uh, I know it seems a bit silly because it will come, but I think it's something we can look at. It's a, it's a, it's a walking housing scheme, so it's something internally we can look at. If it was a private developer, we couldn't insist they do it um, because it's not, we're not in that position yet. Just also add that where extra space to be needed, it, it could in all likelihood be dealt with through a non material amendment, uh, so a very minor amendment to the planning commission were it to be granted. Thanks. Um, just make a couple of quick comments, really. <clears throat> um, affordability, 93%, uh, pretty good. Um, I feel we're getting close to the, where we need to be. we to go make it 100% next time. Um, um, An aspiration. I'm not um, I'd also say another good thing is, is when you look at this map and it shows where the um, trees are being retained and shows where the trees are being lost. You can see how many have been retained, so I think that's quite a good, it was a good effort getting these buildings into that, that shape and saving as many of those as possible, so I applaud that. Um, however, like Wayne, having been there the other day, um, I have a lot of sympathy with the, the traffic side of things, and I can see good arguments why you're not going to use that, that sort of path and getting rid of more trees, but um, it, it did seem quite difficult for us to get in our small cars, so it's obviously going to be a problem, so that's going to need to be managed. But you've been over that already, really. Um, I also have a lot of sympathy with the overbearing. I mean, we, we stood um, approximately where the northern bit of the uh, western block of flats is going to be, which is behind 162, and you could literally see right into 162's garden and kitchen and so on. It, it is 34 metres, I think. Uh, which uh, with, the, with the design guide saying 30 metres, so it's just over. Um, but I mean, also 170, 170 off the, other, the top of the other building is just on the limit. So um, I don't think that would be a problem if one of two things, if the design didn't have these little terrace balconies there, I'm not suggesting we would put them in, but uh, that, I think that, that could have been avoided in some way, I think, or some form of planting along that boundary. I mean, there's going to be three stories, so it's going to be a long time before any planting of my family is going to help. Um, but it's something to think about, I think. Um, and I heard from, I think, the agent that the design of the third floors here is effectively a dark dorm, kind of in the roof design, and that's similar to what's happening on Finch Road and Barker Road. To be fair, I didn't actually look very closely at the when I was there. Um, aren't, aren't they mostly um, single story dorms? They're not kind of double story houses on Finch Road and Barkham Road. So in terms of it kind of fitting into the area, um, that's, that's a question, I don't know whether anybody knows the answer to that. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's it for that. Yeah. Certainly. Um, well, I know the point about overlooking and, and that particular dwelling, um, um, specifically the 34 metres. Um, completely accept that there will be some overlooking from the development to neighbouring properties. Um, and uh, this all part of my assessment. The question I, I asked when assessing this application was, was the overlooking uh, and the, the, um, the overbearingness of, of the, uh, the relationship to existing properties, um, was it, would it cause um, an unacceptable level of harm? Now it's, no, it's normal to have a degree of overlooking in a suburban context like this, back to back between two different houses. Um, and in my view, um, the relationship is, is pretty pretty normal and to be expected, and um, there wouldn't be an unacceptable level of, of harm, in my view. Um, to take a second point about the, the terrace balconies, um, I just um, mentioned the process we went through with the architect in, uh, with, with this application. We did a, some pre-app um, before the application was submitted, and um, the, the applicant also did some, consul some consultation with, with neighbouring residents as well. Originally, there were cantilevered balconies on, on that elevation, and as a result of um, the, the pre-application process, um, they've been replaced with these inset um, terrace balconies. Um, now, there actually, there's um, the roof design at the second floor level um, is such that um, the balconies are, are hidden and the, the roof line comes up to a level of, of um, 1.6 metres, which um, 
I would say, mitigates uh, certainly a lot of the potential overlooking that would otherwise have been the case had they been cantilevered balconies. And uh, as I said, they're inset balconies, so that they're, they're set into the building. I'm planting along the boundary, and that's certainly something that I would expect to be looked at at a condition stage. We have recommended a planning condition um, which requires a submission of a landscaping scheme. Uh, so um, um, my colleagues would, would uh, assess that and, and if they felt it would be appropriate, and I suspect, suspect they may well consider the, the necessity for some sort of planting along the boundary. So that, that's some, certainly something I'll be looking out for. Uh, you mentioned the um, um, compatibility, I suppose, with the, with the design with Finchampstead Road. Um, obviously, it's a you know it's different to what's there on Finchampstead Road, but uh, not to, to the degree that I think there would be any harm, uh, any significant harm. And um, I, I do think it's a good quality of design this building, uh, and I don't think it would look out of place in the area, in, in my view, as a, as a planning officer. So I hope that's answered your questions. Any other member wishing to ask any more questions? Okay, before we say it to the vote then, I would like to make a suggestion on condition 16 to add the bit that the board member and the chairman are consulted on it. Okay. Okay. Are all members happy for us to, to add that? Yeah, yeah all the members. Yes, when I said board members, that was plural, so it's all of them. Involved in it. Okay. members, absolutely no more questions. We will go to the vote. It's recommended for approval as set out on page 14 with a number of conditions and informatives. And then we had the members update, which was, uh, was a change to condition 8 for the hours of construction, moving it to, to 8 o'clock. And I was pleased to see that we've got the, another new condition for electrical vehicle charging and another informative for the protection of the trees. So all those in favour, please show. <coughs> so that's unanimous. Thank you very much, members. That application is passed. Agenda item 41 on page 45 is the Arborville Garrison and Joint Land. It's a reserved matters application for 104 apartments, clubhouse, access from the secondary school, access road, internal access road, parking, landscaping, open space, footpaths, cycleways, and drainage. <coughs> it's before the committee is a major application, and the case officer is Alex Swates, who I shall hand over to. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting application 181658. Uh, it's a reserve matters uh, for 104 apartments in Parcel CT in the Arbor Garrison SDL. The applicant is Christ Nicholson Operations Limited. Uh, a bit of background to the site. The proposal relates to the lands located uh, east of the Nama Wide Extension within the Arbor Garrison Strategic Development Location, SDL, and represents the eighth phase of development. The outline permission for the site was granted in April 2015, uh, and this sets out the development parameters. Uh, a further bit of background, this, is the, this map shows the SDL in its entirety. Uh, I've also labelled on there some key infrastructure links. So, for example, fixed lane to the north uh, and the Namorad extension, which runs through the centre of the site. Focusing in on the northern section of the SDL, uh, approved under the outline. Parcel C2 is located to the south of the site. Uh, the, par the parcel represents the southernmost section of the area reserved for the district centre and is adjacent to the recently approved Parcel Q. Uh, I've also highlighted the previously approved parcels uh, around on the outline application site uh, and you can see this is the eighth phase. So there's the area in red at the bottom. 
Uh, this is just an aerial photograph of the site, uh, the site highlight in red. Uh, as you can see, the site is located between the Namara extension and the Bow Point School. A little bit more context on this one. Uh, the yellow highlighted section to the west of the site is Parcel Q, uh, which is also a um, PRS scheme which was approved back in January by the committee. Uh, and to the north, uh, and in highlighted in blue, is uh, part of the district centre area. Uh, it's, it's worth saying at this point that the process of put forward tonight does not impact on the district centre or its ability to deliver its uses and facilities described under the outline. Uh, the centre was always described to have a re residential element uh, within it, and this is what the application is, uh, but I'll come into that a bit, a bit later. Uh, so, so moving on to the purpose of the application. So the proposal is for 104 private rented sector units. Uh, these are one and two bed apartments specifically built for renting. Uh, they're professionally managed and it increases the type of tenure which is currently very limited within the borough. In terms of affordability, while these units are not considered affordable housing, the deed of variations can sort in order to secure a future sum in the place of this. Uh, so, to move on to the uh, site, that, site layout, uh, as you can see, the proposal uh, consists of four separate apartment blocks, uh, most of which either front onto the public highway uh, or open space to the north. Uh, the site is accessed off the school, secondary school access roads, which is located right, right at the bottom of the van, uh, and the parking is located within the centre of the site. The apartment blocks are located over 80 metres away from the secondary school building uh, and also the proposal includes, in, includes sorry, a management clubhouse uh, located to the north of the site. I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit later as well. So in terms of the compliance of the outline, uh, the site is compliant with both use plan and story heights. Uh, these allow for the proposal to go up to four storeys uh, in, in areas which they do. Uh, in terms of density, while the proposal is high in density, this is due to the characteristics of the proposal. Uh, for example, clearly four, blocks of, four blocks of flats will likely have, will definitely have a high density when in comparison to a more traditional development uh, consisting of uh, semi-detached houses or detached houses. Uh, in terms of access, uh, I've touched on it again, uh, it's off the secondary school access roads, which is accessed off the Narmar Island extension. With regard to uh, its district centre location, it's worth noting that there is a district centre design brief, uh, which is currently pending. Uh, while there is still a lot of work and consultation to do on that before, uh, to get anywhere near a final district centre design, residential units in this location are considered to assist with the viability of this future centre. Again, the proposal will not prejudice the delivery of the district centre and the proposals are located way to the south of that main central area. Furthermore, the building scale uh, is considered to be appropriate given its location uh, and the affordable housing is to be provided as a community sum. In terms of design, the proposal represents a more contemporary design uh, that will define well with the secondary school. Uh, and also the previously approved parcel Q, which is opposite. Uh, these are, so these are uh, two blocks, one of which is uh, three-storey, and the other uh, four-storey with the three-storey element. Again, this is just a visualisation uh, of the proposal. So the proposal includes a management clubhouse. Uh, so this will be used by the management company for the for the PRS site, and this includes such things as office, offices and meeting rooms. Uh, we propose a condition on the application in order to secure uh, the, the use of this clubhouse and also the hours of this building. The hours of use of this building, sorry. Uh, finally, in terms of access and parking, the proposal is accessed as a school access road uh, that links onto an arm wide extension. Uh, and the application price is 127 spaces, which is in accordance with WBC standards. Uh, additionally, similar to the last application, we 
uh, proposed a parking management strategy position on this site. Therefore, it's recommended that the committee grant permission subject to the conditions and the completion of the deed of variation to secure the affordable housing contribution. Uh, so just to quickly touch on the members' updates. Uh, there are a few, there's, there's only a few minor updates in there. Uh, the first being confirmation that this is the eighth phase of development. Uh, there's a bit of an error in the report. Uh, the second is adding the approved plans uh, to the approved plan condition. And lastly, confirmation over the applications, the conditions application that runs alongside the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We have only one speaker for this application, which is Stuart Garnett, the agent. Would you like to come forward? Good evening. Good evening, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Thank you to Alex for the presentation. Um, many of you may recall Chris Dinker, Chairman and Executive Director of Crest Nixon, giving uh, this presentation almost this time last year in relation to Parcel Q. And in his presentation, he discussed the overview about PRS, which Alex has done, and the benefits of that. Um, Crest are obviously delighted with the planning approval for that application. And as you may have seen, this development is well underway with completions expected in a year's time. Institutionally managed PRS has many advantages, not least its accelerated housing delivery as the first resident to move in next year, and we're pleased to be delivering the first PRS schemes in the borough, meeting this much needed housing requirement for Wokingham to encourage young professionals in particular to remain in the area. This is particularly important also to the borough's housing land supply, but also that it provides an alternative form of tenure to traditional home ownership and affordable home housing for those not yet able to get on the ladder. Additionally, we're proposing a clubhouse which includes additional facilities for the PRS residents, such as a lounge area and gym, a management space with offices and meeting rooms. As the entire phase will be managed by a single professional management company, this means buildings, grounds and car parks will be maintained to a consistently high standard, and this creates a great deal of operational efficiency, along with management of the parking areas. This scheme delivers over and above the required parking standards as a quick clarification. There's 127 spaces for residents, there's a further eight spaces for the clubhouse. A road safety audit was completed. This highlighted no safety issues, although we have realigned the access following officer and parish comments. And the designs also now highlight the potential link road to the north into the district centre. This link will be designed in detail as the district centre proposals come forward. Finally, you'll be aware that there has been extensive engagement with the parish councils and the steering group, particularly with regards to design and highways. Crest have worked closely with the parishes to address their comments and amendments have been made to the scheme, and the improvements focus on softening <coughs> the designs for a more varied, lighter palette of materials, the effect on the materials used on the first phase at Arborfield. We'd like to thank the parishes for their extensive engagement and input to the proposals which are before you tonight. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Members, who would like to um, come? <coughs> Thanks. Um, <coughs> quite a few things to get through, but maybe I'll just say a few and then we can go. Um, the type of tenure, current and limited. So, so what's, what's different? Because this looks like private rented accommodation to me, which sounds like we have a lot of. Um, <coughs> that's one question to ask. I'm not quite sure what, what that means. Um, PRS. Um, on page 67, paragraph 73, uh, it says, success of these types of schemes generally lend themselves to lower levels of affordable housing to be made viable. Well, zero percent is, is quite low, I would say. Um, I think you've kept it better than my approach. Um, so it seems to me this commutation of this 35% uh, affordable is a key feature, in fact, probably the only feature of this application, really. Um, it's only one I noticed. Um, I'm a bit worried about the lack of, um, you know, there's, there's a million pounds, apparently, uh, 1.15 million pounds coming in this commuted sum. But I, I, I asked Alex a question about this today, uh, quite short notice, so 
congratulations, but for having a go, thank you. <laughs> um, but I didn't quite get, get the answer really. Um, but I, you know, my sense is that you know we're getting the poor side of the deal. Um, you know, we need affordable housing badly, really badly. Um, there was research last that came up last week, um, and this is for Woking and Borough um, to afford one bed rent for a 22 to 29 year old and quite 45 percent of income, uh, and to afford a two bed rented property for all ages will be 52 percent of income on average. So. Uh, and that's what Shelter and the National Housing Federation call yeah, extremely unaffordable. Oh, but this is the point, this, this is the affordability, it is part of the point. And it's important that we kind of concentrate on um, The Strategic Housing Market Assessment says that 50% of the houses we need to build this year should be affordable. <clears throat> the Core Policy CP5 says there's an exceptional need for affordable housing. And it refers to the SDL specifically being a large part of that. Um, it requires 35% affordable housing. That's provision. You know, I know it's yeah, I think you made your point about the affordable housing. Should we hear the response? Okay. Yeah. Jump in, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so firstly, the private market scheme, what it is, it's, it's, it's managed apartments. So it's, sorry, it's managed apartments. So it's not. Yes, yeah, there's your, your houses that are split into flats, things like that, and there is a, there's none of them in the in the borough. Reading places like that, urban, urban areas, do have it. What they do is they provide a range of housing types within the borough, and we don't have that at the moment. Um, in terms of the PRS and this location, it's actually it's, well, we consider a really good use of the space, um, because you're increasing the population early on in uh, the district centre, the neighbourhood centre. Which gives you a better footfall, which gives you the viability to provide the shops that we're all hoping we're going to get, and, and the rest of the cafes that, that make that centre. And um, so, in, in essence, what it is is that it's just a different type of, of housing stock. And um, the reason, uh, so government is pushing for various uh, types of housing at the moment, affordable being one clearly, private market, market being another, ERS is another one they've, they've raised. Um, so it, it, it provides that variety within the borough, and that's, that's, uh, that's why, as a council, we feel it's important. In terms of the on-site provision, um, the type of units it is, so they, they, you can't have, it, it's, it's like many units, you can't have the, the way they manage affordable units in that. So what they've done is they've paid a contribution for off-site provision. So what they're doing is, in essence, Gorse Ride is a very good example, actually, because Gorse Ride we're renewing the housing stock and we're increasing the housing stock for affordable housing, um, and that was paid for by our schemes. So it's the, it's a similar example to this. So they are paying a sum that we will provide um, the affordable housing elsewhere. Um, so that it, it's not there isn't zero percent. There is there is affordable being provided with. And you refer to uh, the uh, thirty-five um, percent. So thirty-five percent on the on the SDLs is is the starting point. We aim it. Um, they have to be looked at in terms of their viability. Um, and unfortunately, affordable housing is always the thing that's hidden viability. Um, and because the SDLs are what they are, and they provide huge amounts of infrastructure to come with it, um, there is a bit of flexibility in that. So in the Arbutfield example, we have 20% provision on-site, and we have up to 15% or 15% um, off-site provision. Um, so that's why uh, Arbutfield is, is less than the 50% that the, the government requires. Uh, sorry, the, the, the government are stating that we need as part of the, the Berkshire um, housing assessment. Um, the number that's brought up in the Bar Berkshire housing assessment is actually based on uh, it's based on a need for the borough, but that is subject to viability and subject to a site per site basis. So you'll find no council in the country provides the amount that's set out in a strategic housing market assessment for these things. So what we will do is every site that comes forward, we'll look at it, we'll look at the viability options and we'll get the most we can on it. Um, subject to viability. Um, so I don't know if I've answered all your questions on affordable. Um, the, the other thing you asked about, about the, the discounted uh, contribution, it's, it's basically because um, of the type of unit it is. So because there's a management fee attached to it, a management cost attached to it, there's potentially voids in the rent, but you don't have any people in there at the time, so it's costing the, the, the company money. There's an accepted 20% reduction in against private market housing. So that's why there's a slightly less affordable housing contribution.
So I hope that explains a very complicated issue, and I hope I've explained this enough for you. I'm not sure if I have. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's what I expected. Michelle, then Angus. You said there's a commuted sum for the affordable housing. Will you guarantee that there will be new affordable housing? You said Gross Rod, you use that as an example. They're not necessarily building additional housing, they're refurbing the existing housing, from what you said. They, well, they are providing additional housing as well. Uh, but we'd like to see at least that many flats yeah. actually provided, rather than just refurbing flats, so we do have a larger number, because we have a yeah. large population. Uh, do you want me to that, a Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, so, the, so the council is obviously collecting money from developers to provide um, affordable housing, and that is our intention going forward. Um, clearly, we have to have the science to do it and do that, and that's what the affordable housing of the, the housing team that were here earlier on are trying to do. So we are intending to provide additional stock as opposed to just repairing stuff. I mean, it's like I'm going to jump in there. That isn't really for us at this committee to decide where the money is going to be spent. Yeah, I'm just trying just to say that, that we should be building more affordable homes for the residents so we can actually have people can stay here. Yeah. But second of all, you're talking, it does meet the parking <coughs> standards. However, if you'd like to drive down the street here to Outfield Crescent, you can find a nice place that meets the borough parking standards. And it looks like Carmageddon, yeah. not necessarily now. <laughs> uh, uh, so if, if an application meets policy, then it meets policy. Right. I wouldn't want to live nearby. <laughs> There's like, probably a lot of people parking in your but house. Michelle, house. Just obviously, it's not as uh, Tim just mentioned. It's not related to scheme, yes. but Alfred Crescent was it was a scheme that was on the previous standards, which is significantly different from what we have in front of us. It's in a sustainable location next to a train station. The reason it looks worse is because it's still private aspect and it hasn't been adopted yet because the developer hasn't finished it and at that point we can then start to enforce the parking on that site by putting yellow lines. Mm. Until then it's private and people are obviously abusing it close to a station. So it's not as bad as it's made out to be. There's no train station in this development. Angus. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Just a thought, it's going to be interesting when we have the first occupant in somewhere within this SDL coming to talk to one of these applications. <laughs> uh, I noticed there's a sort of, page 51, there's, there's a block of things that were already considered as part of the outline application. As far as SANG and SAM are concerned, is that covered fully to get a contribution rather than needing to be mentioned here as well? Question. Uh, the other one is talking about parking, is right next to the school, who will be, did, did I understand <coughs> from the applicant that they will be r running the parking there? Because I think it might be almost worth an informative, because uh, it's going to be a mighty attractive place for parents to wait up for their children out of school. <laughs> um, the last point is, we've got four-story development. The other side of the road will be the L legal and general application, which we haven't seen the details of yet. So I think it's just worth the note that that's going to have a big impact in the height of the buildings yeah. on what can be developed uh, nearby. Uh, so I'll, I'll do you can come on. Um, so just to jump in on the, uh, the sand point. Uh, this is a reserve matters for uh, an other application which was approved back, back in 2015. Um, a lot of those details of the signs have been approved and uh, they are and it's open. Uh, they had to have it open before the first <coughs> occupation uh, and so that was quite a while ago now the first phase. Uh, so this is the uh, eighth phase and so that, that saying in terms of con contributions and it being open is all. Thank you. And by the way I noticed they're now spelling it correctly. They tried to anglicise Hazebrook, but now they've gone back to the original uh, French spelling. Thank goodness. Uh, just to pick up on the car parking then. Uh, the scheme that's in front of us, you're right, is located next to a school. It is a private scheme, and I'm sure if parking obviously starts to move into that area, I'm sure they'll uh, look to enforce it as quick as they can. Uh, condition 7 um, sets out the parking management strategy for them to highlight and obviously explain how they're going to manage that car park due to the fact that it is next to the district centre and the school and all the parking is identified to be unallocated, uh, which 
is it was an overprovision. The unallocated uh, requires 97, but they provided 127, so they've, they've got over obviously what's needed. Um, allocated is nice and beneficial, and it's something that we do look to do, but in these locations when it's a completely managed scheme, and it's always going to be a managed scheme, then the, the management of it is often better because somebody may not have a car or may only have one car, and therefore it allows for a better use of those spaces rather than have some sound. Uh, just the final point on the energy site. Um, there's, there is actually a green buffer uh, to the south of the school access roads, uh, but at local plan stage, uh, the whole of the SDL was planned that this was the district centre, so they've always been very aware that there will be a built up area within this location. So it shouldn't come as a shock or anything to that. Chris? Just like to back up what the chairman said, we really do have to consider these applications against policy. Even if we'd like more affordable housing, we'd like better parking, if it is within the standard, then we can't really refuse, or at least in respect of those two items. But just to clarify, the affordable housing is 35% for this SDL, yeah. but that's not necessary, not necessarily for each parcel to be to have 35%. But does this mean that for the whole of the SDL, it will eventually come up to 35%? So the very last reserved matter, we'll be able to refuse the total doesn't match the 35%. Yeah, so the, the overall development of the, the entire SDL is 35%. So it will be 20% 20, 20 on-site provision and 15% off-site money for, for doing it elsewhere. If it doesn't meet that, then we'll, as, as it goes along, what we'll do is we'll keep track of as we go along about how much has been provided. If we're getting towards the end and we don't have enough, we'll insist they provide more affordable housing. Any other members wishing to put a question, clarification on anything? No? We're all done. Well, then, it's set out then for approval, and so on page 47. See, so there's the set of conditions there, and a couple of changes or updates in members update. So all those who are capable of passing this application, please show. And that's one, two, three, one, two, three. And those against, one against, and, and one abstaining. So that application is passed. Thank you, members. Item 42 on page 85, and it's the Winners Relief Road Phase 2. So, this is got, it's a full application for the relief road connecting the B3030 King Street Lane with Winners Relief Road Phase 1 to the A329, and that's including two new roundabouts, two new residential access roads, and associated works including signals, crossing, drainage, footway, and cycleways. It's before the committee as it's a major application and the applicant is Woken Borough Council. The committee went on a site visit on Friday and we had a briefing on Monday which two of the ward members also attended. I now will hand over to the um, case officer, Laura Turner. Thank you, Chair. 
This is an application for phase two of the Windows Relief Road. The application was amended following public consultation and re-consultation was carried out from the 11th of September until the 24th of September this year. There's an error in the um, officer report referring to 2019 and that's reported on the update paper. The application site comprises an, of an area of land north of the M4 and an area of land south of the M4. It includes the current Winash allotments, which are to be relocated, and it also includes an area of woodland on the western side of Reading Road, north of the M4, within which the new section of Relief Road will be built and will join the existing London Road, leading to phase one of the Relief Road. The road is proposed as an alternative route for non-local traffic travelling through the area and also to address the increase in traffic volumes. Where phase two of the relief road would meet the existing phase one junction of King Street Lane, it's proposed to modify this junction so that there would be no right turn out of London Road onto King Street Lane and no right turn from King Street Lane into phase one of the relief road to ensure adequate management of traffic flows. Uh, the southernmost proposed roundabout would be located adjacent to the BP garage and on the allotment land and would provide a connection to the planned North Wakingham and Distributor Road for which a planning application is likely to be forthcoming next year. As a result of public consultation, the roundabout has moved away slightly from the residents enabling an increased area of landscaping outside numbers 286 to 290 Reading Road and a shared space for access and pedestrians and cyclists. The northernmost round route would provide the link to the new part of the relief road itself and again after taking into account residents' concerns this roundabout was moved away from neighbouring dwellings to provide a larger access road and an area for tree and landscape screening. This also enabled the retention of three significant trees, which offers benefits to the public realm. So traffic modelling has identified that traffic growth within the borough will severely impact upon Winnesha Winner Road Network, and the proposed development would address this and result in improvements through delivering a key piece of infrastructure reducing traffic flows on Reading Road, an enhanced network resilience, and the conclusion of this section of the A329 National Cycle Network. The principle of development is both identified within and supported by the development plan as an essential piece of infrastructure to address existing traffic problems and support ongoing development within the borough. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to conditions, and members will note a change to Condition 8 in the members' update. Thank you very much. I think we have a number of um, people ready to speak on this one, and the first one is Paul Fishwick, representing Winnersh Parish Council. Would you like to come forward? Welcome. Thank you, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm the Vice Chairman of Woodrush Parish Council and Vice Chairman of Planning. Firstly, I would like to thank officers and councillors of Wokingham Borough Council for taking into account the five pages of objections and comments that Woodrush Parish Council put forward in June 2018 that have now been reduced to just one page. And the positive steps in eliminating these is most appreciated. However, some do remain and I do not wish for the planning application to be rejected, but as a balance, the following are suggested as conditions to be considered during design or delegated authority. <coughs> On plan one, I've got some plans. That's it. So on plan one, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, keep clear markings is needed on King Street Lane at its junction with Grassmere Close and outside the access to properties 45, 45A, 47, 47A 
to allow vehicles to enter and exit the service road. A similar arrangement has been successful in King Street Lane and Robinwood Lane. Also on plan one, a raised table crossing is required at Sandstone Close, set back from the main carriageway by five metres, as suggested in local transport note 0208. This would make the junction safer by reducing the speed of people driving and cycling at these junctions. This design has been successful <coughs> on the cycle footway on Lower Early Way and incorporating the design at Woodward Close. On plan two, same arrangement at Le Burnham Close for the setback. That's the plan two. <laughs> plan two, same arrangement for the site the table to go across the Burnham uh, Close. Uh, the Burnham Road, sorry. Uh, plan three, as Woking Borough Council seem fixed on installing roundabouts rather than traffic signals, the new roundabout will be a barrier to non-motorised traffic and have a detrimental impact on pedestrians and cyclists. This will also create potential conflict between pedestrians and cyclists and motorised vehicles that currently do not exist, and therefore an increased personal injury accidents. My suggestion is a two can cross here from the southern arm as a compromise. The two roundabouts and limiting of turning movements for Woodwall close to left in and left out only are a significant disbenefit to residents and visitors accessing housing, Wheatfield School and other premises. My suggested solution is to relocate the plan two can crossing to the west. That will allow for stacking capacity for right turning traffic coming out of Woodward Close with a set of advanced signals on the eastern side of this junction linked to the Tuvalu crossing. The air quality issue under and around the M4 is for Woking Borough Council to explain in their annual air quality action plan as it goes against their own principles. And finally on plan four, the amendments at Green Lane are welcomed, but there is a need for a key clear marking at this junction that would allow the infrequent right turn of traffic to filter in and out of Green Lane. Although not needed now, the Toucan will be required on the northern arm of the allotments roundabout. Thank you for allowing me the time to put forward these suggestions to you and for your consideration. It's most appreciated. Thank you. Right, next we have Richard Harrison from Odyssey on behalf of Luff Development and Rajiv Sudar, resident. Between you, you have three minutes, so are you having a minute and a half each, or how are you doing it? Yeah, that's news to me that we were sharing the yeah. How do you I'm, mean? I'm, I'm, well, I've, I've told I have three minutes, so I've got three minutes. I will just look to Matt then. Uh, I'd say you can only have a minute and a half each because otherwise each each group has to have the same amount of time as you, so they would have to add six minutes, and we're not going to be doing that tonight because they weren't told. Other people weren't told they'd have increased time, so it's a minute and a half. I'm sorry. Less, less than a minute to work because I've got three minutes to speak. So. Would you like to go first then? Yep, you have to go. Go on. Yeah. Good evening, thank you for having us. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from uh, 290 and 286 Reading Road. Um, we have uh, serious concerns about proximity of the roundabout and the new designs uh, which have been put in place. Um, I appreciate that the, the roundabouts are there to probably uh, reduce the traffic flow by it's going to have an adverse effect. Um, looking at the property between 315 and 303, uh, they made certain con uh, complaints against how close the roundabout was to their properties and in turn their um, 
rather than us being moved out nearly double the bed that we have. Um, we've, we've raised our concerns with Sam Gross um, and Laura, uh, we've sent an email to as well. The other aspect is, is that the actual uh, second revision in the plans, uh, which I think Laura said was between September 11th and 24th September, none of our three properties actually received any documentation to show any changes in the plans. So we are unaware of that until last week when we met with Sam. <coughs> Furthermore, there is, from the more reviews of our plans, it appears that there is a potential clash between the land falling within the red line plan donating the existing or the planning application and the title to our properties. <coughs> it's unclear whether the works proposed are within the application effect ridership and a certificate of being that it has not been served to me as the owner of the property. Um, I should also say that the proposal seeks to adversely impact the property and falls close to our boundaries um, compared to other uh, properties within the facility. And I think as a, as a minimum to agree, um, we would like to make a few conditions which are that the, set, the footpath and the, the road um, are separated so that we do not have pedestrians and cyclists going through the road. Um, then we have an in and out turning from the roundabout. If you could speed up, please. Yeah, I'm in position. And then there's a left turn from the uh, 290 uh, ready road, left turn only rather than one end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two main concerns. There have been an apparent lack of suitable option testing of alternative junction arrangements to the roundabout. Uh, two signal options were tested for the northern junction, but no alternative options were tested for the southern. There's been no justification whatsoever for this presented by the Council. This clearly shows that the Council has not demonstrated that the proposed roundabouts are the most suitable option. We also have material misgivings about the operation and safety of the proposed roundabouts, despite being safety audited. These include lack of sufficient visibility, swept path analysis showing vehicles overrunning into other lanes, and the major concern being safety deficiencies for pedestrian and cyclists. For example, the need for them to cross two entry lanes at the roundabouts. This is especially difficult for vulnerable road users, such as the elderly and school children, and is a situation which could have been avoided with a signal junction. To compound this, it is also concerning the amount of detail that development control considers suitable to lead to the detailed design stage, matters which are considered fundamental to the design and delivery of the scheme and which have to be dealt with now. It is therefore unclear that the scheme has been appropriately selected by informed decision making and it is considered that the proposed roundabouts are fundamentally deficient with implications for their acceptability, safety and delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Ian Haller from Woken and Borough Council. consists of the two roundabouts we talked about, the link up to London Road. Uh, that therefore links into phase one which Bovis has built and then that continues into uh, no early way where we're planning to dual that between phase one and the showcase roundabout. Uh, as it's been highlighted already, uh, during the consultation period we've taken advantage and amended some areas of the scheme. Uh, that's been uh, well received and uh, thanking those people that have provided input to that. Uh, and all uh, I have left to say is that if approved, the scheme will go into immediate detailed design and we'll be looking for construction commencement in autumn of 2019. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. 
And finally, we have the two board members, Philip Holdsworth and Prue Bray. They are both having a minute and a half. Good evening to you both. Good evening, good evening, gentlemen, good evening, chairman, good evening, members of the planning committee. Um, I'm a borough councillor, as you know, representing Winnish, and uh, I'm here to support the planning application for the Winnish Relief Road. It's been a long time coming. The first bit of it was built over 20 years ago, and so it's really welcome. And the scheme went out, did go out to consultation, as you know, and I'd like to thank the planners um, for the very hard work that they have carried out in taking on board the uh, results of the, the, the consultation. And um, as we've already heard from the Parish Council, they actually reduced their objections from five pages to one. I didn't know until tonight that they were in fact going to uh, approve it. Um, I was presumed that we still going to oppose it. It's not wholly surprising, um, given that the main purpose of the road is to facilitate through traffic from other parts of the borough, and that in fact is stated as the main objective of this road. And nevertheless, it's going to deal with a growing quantity of local traffic in the centre as a result of new housing and the development of the ministry. Now, some residents will be inconvenienced, there is no question about that, and some cust customary trips may have to be tackled in a very different way. But this is, an, I think, inevitable when you try to squeeze new roads into an existing layout. But many will welcome this connectivity and the ease of access that the new road will give to all parts of the borough. So we have to look to the future and the possibility that this reduction in through traffic could give the residents the ability of replanning the crossroads area to accommodate a focused central area for which something If you could mind that, then, Philip, thank you. I know in the past there have been plans for additional retail units in this area, and I've asked the officers to see what scope there is to provide a central focus. Okay, thank you, So, I would ask, sorry, if that is it? Yeah, but you've got well, the committee to look beyond the present plan, recognise what is essential for Hello everybody, I'm not going to repeat any of that. I am also here to support the road, reluctantly, because I know that there are some losers out of it, but we will be worse off without it. But without, um, so, so uh, you know, it, it's one of those things, on balance, I think it has to go ahead. What I would ask is that you will consider the points made by the Parish Council um, and by the residents of 286 to 290 during the detailed design stage that's going to follow. So if there is anything you can do to tweak the design further, I'm sure you will do that. You've brought it a long way as officers from where it was, which we do appreciate. Um, I, I would also ask that the committee consider the same change to the construction condition, which I think is condition five, as you put on the course ride application, in that there should be liaising with all three local members about the, con the um, construction environmental management plan. And also I noticed in that condition there is a community liaison officer, and I would specifically ask that that community liaison officer liaises with the borough councillors and the parish council in particular. Um, because this is going to be a big issue for our ward um, and we actually need to manage it carefully. Um, it's probably the most significant change that we've had and I've been a councillor for 18 years. So, as I say, reluctantly, I, th I think we need this road more than um, the problems that it's going to bring. Uh, the, it overrides it, the need for the road overrides those. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. Okay, before I open it up to members, I'm going to ask the officers to come back on some of those points. And I say there were a good number of points, so members, if I haven't picked them all up, please, in your questioning, bring them up. So, um, there was a reference to Plan 1, which was the King Street Lane for a, a keep clear markings on the road. There was the raised table crossing at Sandstone. On plan two, there was a, the Burnham Close, another, I think it was a table crossing. 
On plan three, there was a toucan crossing on the, the south arm, and there was also the request to um, m move the crossing so there could be a, a right turn, was it, for Woodward Close. And I think the penultimate one was on the plan four that we saw, which was Green Lane, another keep clear, and a, a toucan crossing at the allotment arm. And there was a question on air quality, which would be for your good self. Um, okay. And then we also had um, <coughs> questioning what the, the option testing on the roundabouts was. And then we had the safety on the roundabouts. And we did take note of the, um, to add on the condition five about the construction, but I'll come to that later in the debate. Um, I think there was a fair few things there, so I'll try and pick them up as we go along. In terms of the key clears, it's just a typical white lining exercise, and given it's kind of light detail, that can very easily be picked up from detail design. I have no issue with that, but it's something uh, I think we could easily add. Uh, or have added the applicant to could install. Um, in relation to the raised tables, this is something we probably would have to go through a separate process to it's something that I think the applicant wouldn't necessarily have an issue in installing, um, uh, but it would need to be uh, under a separate process and it would need to be advertised. The residents obviously would need to come back as a form of traffic calming and therefore we need to go through a traffic regulation order process and it's subject to a separate um, process which if you ask me to be put on here now, it may fail that because the resident might object to it at that time. So it's something that could be considered, but it's not something that I would link to my application because if it can't be achieved, then obviously it can't be delivered. Um, in terms of the roundabout uh, versus signals, uh, clearly there has been some work undertaken by the applicant uh, in relation to the northern, which is on the NDR roundabout. Um, that so we've got the two roundabouts, also the one that leads to the actual Ridge Ridge Road itself, and then there's the second roundabout which leads to the NDR. So that application is being worked up, and as Laura mentioned, is coming to, in front of planning, I believe, has been submitted in February. So through that application, some option testing obviously was looked at in relation to the, the, the junction itself. Uh, I think we need to bear in mind there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate around roundabouts or signals. Uh, many members uh, and residents wish to have roundabouts because it's, it helps some free flowing traffic. You normally always put a roundabout in as kind of, uh, sorry, a signals in as your kind of last resort. Yes, they do help to manage the network and you can kind of control demand. Um, I think the thing is with it is people who live in this area, they're aware of Reading Road. It typically is a peak hour congested part and therefore during non-peak hours, you're kind of starting to restrict and hold up users by stopping them that obviously lights when maybe they're not necessarily have to be stopped at. So the roundabout I think was deemed to be by the applicant the best submission. It's been submitted as part of this application. The application is in front of us. The application has been assessed by the transport team. They found it to be acceptable, meets uh, traffic requirements. Uh, and my understanding from obviously speaking to the team uh, and the officer who looked at the looked after the application, that there was a very marginal difference between the two in terms of operational benefit. So the roundabouts was obviously the one that's gone in. Um, safety audits have been undertaken. Uh, I don't disagree in terms of uh, comments around roundabouts aren't always the best option for cyclists and uh, pedestrians. Uh, however, there are facilities provided. There is a uh, Toucan Cross being upgraded where Woodward Close is. Um, and clearly it would just, um, then as you get further along to Sainsbury's, if you're carrying on that direction, uh, then clearly there's one to bring you back. Appreciate that obviously there are some other arms that don't have it. It's something that I think can be considered. Uh, it's not something that we have a major problem with. Obviously, we need to understand the impact that they could have also on the flow of traffic by adding a pedestrian crossing of those arms. However, again, it's not uncommon. We've got many roundabouts in the borough that are new that carry a similar level of traffic that have uncontrolled crossings on them. But most of the Norfolk and Stuart's Road, which is going to carry a similar level of traffic, has new roundabouts in Twyford Road, which are uncontrolled crossings. And then within the development areas, we have crossings that take us from one side to the other side. Um, oh, uh, in a controlled manner. Uh, green Lane, what's the question on Green Lane? Keep yeah, clear. Keep clear, again, again, yeah, it's not hard pick that up on the earlier part. Uh, safety audit, uh, the visibility sways, swept paths. Again, we're very constrained in terms of this part of the network. It's uh, identified, it's been identified for a long time, as everyone's mentioned, in terms of the core strategy for delivery of this road. It's been uh, identified site 
uh, and this is site for a long time prior to that, um, and therefore it is constrained. Some work has been done to relocate the roundabout further south for the Winch Relief Road link, uh, and that was possible because there is land available to the, the, the next chapter next of the roundabout. Uh, that was very difficult. From my understanding, there was uh, options looked at in terms of relocating it. It's been relocated as far as it possibly can. That in itself has, re has resulted in some departures in uh, very, uh, the reduction of some forward visibility on approach to the roundabout as a result of that. And therefore, it's kind of squeezed into an area that is available. Any further than that, then obviously it does start to affect a land that is outside of the control. We've also got the embankments for the M4, which start to affect the constraints of that roundabout in that location. Um, so the comments made have been taken on board. They are something that we've obviously looked at and considered, and we've found the scheme to be um, acceptable and brought in front of you to Equality, please. Well, there's a specific question I was generally thinking, um, about the roundabout and 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 the it's an air quality management area and you are forcing additional traffic into that particular area. So my, my question was, air quality issues under and around the M4 uh, bridge is for Wokingham Borough Council to explain then in their annual uh, action plan. That was, that was the point I was making. Thank you. If you could respond to that. Uh, yes, I mean... Well, to, to the microphone to everybody can hear so, um, the, yes, there is an air quality action plan in place for um, the air quality management area. Um, and yes, there will have to be actions in place to reduce the um, improve on the air quality in that area. I can't really say any more than that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rochelle, Rochelle, as ward member. Okay, several things. Some of them I've already talked to Chris about, but during the detailed design phase, can we look at the tables on laburnum and sandstone and do the consultation during the design phase so they could actually be instituted before they go forward? Um, we'd be happy to help with the consultation and knock on every door in that area to talk to them and ask them if they want it or not, if you'd like. Um, can we also have some conduits or channels underneath there so we can put in traffic signals or put in crossings if we want to in the future. If you put it in first, just put the pipe underneath there so you just thread the wire through afterwards. It would be useful. That way we don't tear the whole thing up and we decide to put them in later as it suggested. Um, uh, also, could you possibly look at having the chair and highways to talk about some of the things that Paul has brought up uh, for the details and anything that could be done could be done after the after everything is already approved and subject to the chair and highways to do that. The one page that he brought out with all of the very details. Yeah, I mean obviously some of the some of that one page were related to the area. Quality action plan management area. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, there are, but I do, I do agree. Yeah. In terms of those, the islands, uh, the, the raised tables yes. which you mentioned, that's, uh, as far as we're concerned, it's highway boundary and obviously the schemes identified as red line boundary. All of those elements can be delivered. None of them prejudice the scheme from being delivered. It's yeah. not something that's outside the red line boundary, so it's not, it's not something that is an issue. We can obviously address and pick them up. Where possible, through the design and review, there yes. can be the delivery of those ducting. I don't see that being a major problem. It's something we've done on other roads to future proof them to prevent them from taking them up in the future. Um, yeah. okay. Okay. Furthermore, you did move a lot of the design in the area there to make it safer for pedestrians and safer for um, cyclists after consultation with the board members and the parish council. And I think you've done a good job with that. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, a lot of was made, a lot of changes were made yes. following that, and we took them on board and, and obviously delivered them where they, they could be. And we've made sure that we've enforced the outputs we said. Okay. Angus? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I think highways 
matters seem to be the, the matter of the day, don't they? Yeah. Um, but the Reading Road end, um, I think the difference from some of the cases that Chris was talking about is the continuity of the cycleway and the importance of that uh, uh, and the um, conflict with the roundabouts and with pedestrians. But the main point I, I want to make is really at the King Street lane in. Um, there's a third way, isn't there? There's, there's roundabouts, there's traffic lights, or there's roundabouts with traffic lights. Um, which, like the um, showcase, I know that's a bigger sort of system. Why is there the logic for roundabouts on the Reading Road, but not at King Street Lane? Because the situation now with the park winter bypass ain't working well. There's queues all the time. The flows are totally uh, restricted. Um, and I just wonder whether there's any reason why that could not have been or could be a roundabout. Yep. Apart from anything else, as I say, it's not working at the moment. And looking at the people of Sandstone and the Burn getting to Sainsbury's, for instance, for a big shot, is, is a big detour. I'm sure there are other cases, but it's just uh, satisfaction that that is not an option. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we need to go back. Hatch Farm, you know, obviously, as I said, this road's been on the scheme for a long time. Hatch Farm Dairies came in front of the committee a number of years ago now, and that junction was designed at that time to consider. Uh, it was looked at, various options. I don't think we've got, we've got an area for King Street Lane on one of the plans. Um, it, it's very constrained. The M4 bridge is directly adjacent to it, and therefore it just it was just not physically possible with the land take available to, for that to be delivered at the time, which was something that both the developer for Hatch Farm Dairies um, was, was delivering. Um, and it, it's not something that is not physically possible now with what's, what's available. Oh yeah, I mean, obviously that's open one In terms of, yeah, it's obviously identified to work significantly better as well for its current form. Um, unfortunately, obviously, it, it's in, it's, in a kind of a state of yeah. non-completeness mm -hmm. uh, due to some of the other the, the manoeuvres not working correctly. Um, but obviously they get addressed as part of phase two. There are some bad manoeuvres in there, uh, appreciate that, but obviously they're part of the elements as well due to the constraints and due to making the network you know, beneficial. I think everyone's mentioned there are some, there will be some slight losers there are, with, but there's significant benefits in relation to the, the reduction in traffic on, on Reading Road for one, and obviously the improvement of the, of the network as a whole. I think resilience is also something that we need to consider looking at the Reading Road now in relation to the SGM works that take place. You know, to have an alternative route running parallel on that corridor is quite a significant benefit and showcase roundabout at times of flood. You know, this obviously generates a, an alternative resilient route that allows for access to tool still take place. Yeah, just coming back on that, the whole idea of this is to relieve Winners Crossroads. Uh, and I've just got this vision that we're just creating a new Winners Crossroads at the crossing of King Street Lane, whatever we do. Yeah, yeah. Right, before I come to the show, is there anyone new? Malcolm? Yes, thank you. Uh, are those the only two right turns that are banned at the moment on the, on the scheme? Because originally there were more right turns stop. The one that concerned me was coming out of the phase one and turning right to go south. That's that's not a restriction anymore, is it? No. Okay, good. Um, and the second point was, uh, you referred to uh, Red Road being quite busy anyway, throughout the day, but during the quiet times, by having traffic lights at a roundabout, it might slow it down unnecessarily. But you can have times traffic lights. Well, you, you can turn traffic lights off for three hours between the rush hours without any great problem. So you <coughs> turn it off, isn't it? You don't have to operate for 24 hours a day. No, you don't. I mean, it's not ideal. Um, and it's not something. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's not, not necessarily ideal. It's not something that we'll see. We look to kind of try to deliver all the time. Um, but it, it's. Something that's obviously not felt necessary in this scheme. Well, except you said that uh, during quiet times, people would then have to stop at traffic lights because they might change because they're in the operation. You could just turn them off outside the rush hour. Uh, well, you know, you'd probably leave them operating still, the operator will move it, for example, so it would obviously you know, look after the arm. So it wouldn't necessarily slow anything down in that case, though? Uh, not always, but obviously there's an element of 
there will be you know, random routes tend to flow quite freely, whereas obviously, you know, as soon as you start putting signals into that, if somebody's coming from one of the opposing arms, then clearly there will be um, you know, an element where there will be some slowdown. It was purely picked up from comments that obviously have been made and expressions that, you know, that members and residents, like British Crossroads, for example, they want that to be changed to a random um, so it's something there is a mixed view as to where they are. The applicant has obviously done significant work in the background, and what they've submitted is what they've submitted, and we've tested it as any application would be submitted and tested. And we found that this submission obviously is acceptable in our terms. Okay, uh, last point. Um, pedestrian crossings is one at each roundabout, is that? Are uh, they two kinds or whatever they're called? Is there one at each of the two roundabouts, the northern and the southern one? Or is there no. just yes. one at one roundabout? Is it? No. There's no, two, no crossings? There's a two-can crossing between both roundabouts, okay. uh, near Woodward Close, uh, which again will allow and used, obviously. It's the one in the middle, okay. And then each of the roundabouts have uncontrolled crossings on the traditional roundabout um, with tactile bay. Yeah, okay, that's a bit, I didn't get on Friday, I thought there was going to be one at the roundabout, but there's one between the two. Okay, thank you. Carl? Thanks. <clears throat> um, I campaigned, campaigned against the original when I should leave for phase one, uh, and that's round areas. Um, uh, and uh, now I'm kind of a respectable, respectable troublemaker instead. Um, uh, mainly because of the traffic is going to dump onto one road away. Obviously, that's not part of this, uh, this application, but I'm just interested to it. I see the, the point about um, the condition eight improving the Rushy Way, Low Road Way junction, um, and that that will happen before. Uh, this development commences, which is good. What about for people who are going to turn right out of that junction towards the showcase? There seems to be some idea that it will get dueled at some point from that junction. Yes, when is that happening, etc. So I'm kind of interested to see what that's going about. And the other thing I want to mention is, I think the resident who objected, uh, who lives next to the southern roundabout on Reading Road, uh, was complaining about or asking maybe for separation of cycles and pedestrians. I think we talked about it when we were at site visit and we were talking about constraints of space. Yeah. But I think it's something that should be looked at if we can. Um, I think that's important. I cycle a lot. I don't want to be messing around with cars too much myself. So. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. And uh, fine. Uh, in terms of the Ministry of Road Dueling, um, that is currently programmed for completion, construction completion target is September 2020. So it's due to kind of run a long time in comparison to this. So that may, may be sooner, subject obviously to deliverability uh, of the programme. Uh, and then just pick it up back to the point about the entrance to that area. It's uh, the reason for that shared space, and I think the, the applicant has worked quite well in terms of delivering that uh, from in this area, is, is just for the right that it does provide that, some of that green space uh, and that segregation. In terms of the mixture, it's looking free residential units. Uh, and that's probably not a lot different to them crossing the footpath cycleway as it stands now, where they'll pull out onto it. There's going to be a change in material, uh, and it will be wider with some landscaping. It won't be directly adjacent to the carriageway. There'll be, you know, that obviously that wider you know, location. That wider location, obviously, there where it will only be a, a, a very short section where there'll be that shared facility. Um, it's again not something we find to be an issue. But it can be looked at if, if they want something more traditional, and, but it will mean the loss of some of the green space. It will be pushing it out and changing that, that effect. Okay. Okay, I've got Wayne, then Bill, then Michelle. Uh, just a few points of observation. It's quite clear that what we've got here isn't 100%, but it's moved a long way listening to the debate this evening um, from where it started. We've obviously got an expert over there. From Winnish Parish Council, which is quite encouraging. Um, and I'm sure if we keep Winnish Parish Council as proof, suggest, and the other two borough councillors engaged, including the residents at 290 and 286, it might go smoothly. I think if we don't do that, um, I think this isn't going to go very smoothly at all. So I think communication, communication, communication as we move forward. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, uh, first of all, say I do support this scheme. I travel regularly from Woodley to Shudin, and I've sat in the traffic that we've suffered more recently because of uh, the, the gas main works. Um, 
I know that will improve, but it, this has got to be a good scheme. At our briefing the other night, I did ask a question about the cyclist, and I'm still concerned about this. For a cyclist who's travelling, say, from Wokingham, wishing to go to Sainsbury's, the number of times that they're going to have to cross the road and cross roundabouts and change direction or change across the lanes to actually achieve that seems to be a little bit difficult for pedestrians and both cyclists. The other thing about part-time lights, uh, or sorry, adding lights onto a roundabout, you're saying that um, they're only needed at peak times. Uh, whilst I know this is nothing to do with this plan application, could you do something about the window triangle lights? They're not uh, needed at <laughs> <laughs> times. Thank you. Um, Okay, just picking up a few bit. Obviously, one um, Winnish will be changed. Well, well, we change as part of the scheme, but obviously levels will reduce. And I think, obviously, over time, Redding Road will be reviewed as part of environmental improvements, you know, increasing public transport accessibility because it will become a quiet route, an alternative route. It's not being replaced. It will still be there, still be used, and give people a choice. Um, but obviously, that's something also that can be picked up. In terms of cycles, um, I do understand what you're saying. Um, I think, but it's worth bearing in mind that, for example. <coughs> As we were on site Friday, there did seem to be the majority of people cycling on the southern side, which is the side we were stood on. Um, so if you were cycling on there at the moment, there's actually really no different if you look at the scheme. So you'll cycle along, you'll cross over Sadler's Lane, which is you do now. You'll go through that small shared space scheme, which is the same as riding along the front of those properties now. You'll carry on past the roundabout, you'll cross over Sadler's Lane, as you do now. Then you'll come to the Toucan Crossing, which isn't currently there, next to Woodward Close. You'll cross the river close onto the northern side, and then you'll continue all the way through. So you're missing the roundabout. You'll only have to cross at the roundabout arms if that's the manoeuvre that you kind of wish to take. But there is a route there. Granted, you might need to think about it or approach to it. But if, if you are just going straight down, clearly that's one example of a route that you're heading on. If you're going in different directions, then there are different areas you might need to cross at. But there is the facility that allows you to go from east to west with crossing at a formalised crossing and then actually putting you into a very similar position that you would be now on Redding Road. Okay, I'll take point. Michelle? Uh, a few things. Sound barrier, we spoke about sound barriers along the relief road to mitigate the problems with the extra traffic and you did say you'd look into those. Um, and also, is a zebra crossing on King Street Lane just beyond where Woodish really Road 1 and 2 come together. And there's a signalized crossing there. It seems redundant to have a zebra crossing and a signalized crossing on either side of the M4 um, overpass. Uh, there was supposed to be a safety order with that. Has it been done? When will it be done if it hasn't been? And when can we look at possibly removing it? Because at this point in time, uh, traffic going up King Street Lane block the Zebra Crossing uh, on a regular basis. And pedestrians have to go out between cars, and it's much more dangerous than it was having a signal on crossing. And lastly, when is Triangle Lights? I was actually speaking to the executive member for highways about that this afternoon. And he said, we're going to look at it and see if we can make them part time. Okay. I think that will be celebrated through most of the borough, actually. <laughs> Uh, if you've had that conversation with the exec member, then that's fine. I can't make any comment yes, until uh, it comes to us. Uh, in, in relation to the zebra crossing, again, it's not part of the scheme in front of us, uh, but you are right, part of the King Street Lane junction when it was implemented as part of the 278 uh, road safety audit was undertaken. My understanding, that hasn't raised any concern. It, obviously, the inspector, the auditor would have undertaken the site visit, would have seen it was 100 metres, obviously, to the south. Uh, it hasn't expressed any concern. It's something that obviously the team, when they did it with this road, you can look at it again, it's not used, and obviously uh, I don't personally have a problem with it being removed. I don't see it duplicating, but my understanding is people did want it, it is there. Uh, before King Street Lane was delivered, the traffic did often back back through it, so the, the current situation is no different to what it did existingly. But in terms of you know, highway code, it's not ideal if you're in a traffic jam to sit on the zebra crossing anyway. So, it, it, granted, it's not the best solution for someone to cross, but it, it, is, it has flashing beacons. You are on approach to it, so even in traffic, it is, you should still take care and check there's nobody there. But 
it's also difficult to see sometimes when you're going through that bridge and it's been one of those things that we weren't, we, we, it wasn't in the best location, but we do have signalized crossing and some of the people have been asking to remove it because there have been times when children have almost been hit because they're going through traffic, the traffic is coming up, we now have a traffic signal there uh, where the relief roads come together and as a result traffic does back up more often than it did in the past. Yeah. Okay, I mean, in terms of, it's not part of the scheme, but I'm happy for it to be picked up outside of here to have a look at part, part, not part of the scheme, part of the works to have it removed if, if it's been necessary. Angus? One last thing, two seconds for When you're taking down the trees and everything like this, please use the uh, same idea you were going to use at Gorse Ride to make sure that you keep it quiet and only do it during the times since it is occupied areas there. No, it's 8 o'clock rather than 7.30 to start work. Right, Angus? King Street Lane, yeah, I'm, I'm getting increasingly concerned about it. I totally support what Rochelle said there. It is a worse situation approaching those traffic lights, including for the, the crossing. Can I just ask, because King Street Lane is ever more used because of developments in other places away from here. What traffic modeling has been done about the impact on that junction yep. once the Winner Shreef Road re relief road is fully complete? Because I have serious consideration about the use of King Street Lane. Yep, okay. Um, various assessments are undertaken. We have a strategic transport model. Um, we don't use that to give us the answers. We use it to basically understand and identify an area that we need to look at. Traffic surveys are now taken to give us a live, up-to-date, you know, set of data that, that the applicants can work from. Uh, and that's also used as a validation check against the model. Um, I think there's, there is a ton of data in the transport assessment. Uh, and I think it's probably just worth putting out. I know that's one you mentioned, so I did just quickly highlight it, actually. Um, but it's worth noting that, for example, the B3 B3030 Mole Road, northeast of Mill Lane, it's the one northbound. Um, basically, the base year peak hour, uh, AMP, I believe it is, yeah, AMP, has a flow of 626 on it. If we move forward to 2019, for example, which is just identified as the, uh, the opening year, uh, uh, do minimum to that just naturally growth is going to increase to 823. Uh, the 2019 do something increases further to, to 986. Um, however, 2026 do minimum, and this is what we need to bear in mind. It's the core strategy is the, the kind of the capture of all of the associated infrastructure and development. So by 2026 it's intended that all the infrastructure is delivered, most of the developments obviously in place, uh, and it does seem to have an effect. So the Alpha Cost Relief Rose delivered, the Eastern Relief Rose obviously completed, NDR, SDR, etc. Uh, and therefore, in 2026, it drops to, um, it doesn't drop, it increases from base, from 626 in the base to 786, which is due minimum still in 2026, and then 774 uh, in 2026 do something. So, yes, there is an increase of about 150 vehicles from base year through to future peak, but if you look at the 2026 do nothing, which is 786, versus do something, which is 776, Basically, about the, you know, we're talking about the same day variation between obviously where, where things are going to be and what the scheme delivers. So the, it's there is elements on approach to construction and delivery of all of the infrastructure. We find in you know, uh, Shinfield there's a lot of congestion around the time that was being built. That area obviously has seen benefits recently, and I think we'll just see more and more come online as the infrastructure is delivered holistically as part of the wider package of infrastructure is identified to be. But hopefully that kind of gives you some uh, easing of your concerns, uh, Angus. But you know that's um, industry used tools that are obviously uh, provided and, and assessed. I think the evidence is there today. But there's no infrastructure there today to accommodate it. Right, members, are there any more questions? Okay. From what I was hearing during the debate. The, um, the construction, which is condition five, members would be happy for us to add the bin that 
the chairman and the three board members are consulted on it. Yes. So we are agreed on on that. Right. I'm a bit less clear what we agreed on for the um, marking on the road for the keep clear. Whether we agreed we were going to do that or how how are we going to do with that? Come through. Uh, it comes through a, a separate detail design process in the next year. It's it's not a massive thing. We will submit to you know chapter management. It gets considered. It gets reviewed. Um, now typically, like if you want to buy outside your driveway or outside the road, obviously we get assessed. Uh, so in this scheme, it can be assessed, but there's nothing preventing it from being delivered. So it can be delivered inside the red line boundary. I have, I'm not happy for you to comment it or note it in the minutes, um, and it's something that gets picked up and potentially addressed. But it, it's not a, it's not be on end or it's not a showstopper for the scheme in front of you. Okay. Michelle, as we look to you for a ward member, would you be looking to have all of those key clears? Noted. I would like to see the key everyone clear. Here, please, I would like to see those key clears noted, but particularly in Grassmere, which is really difficult to get out during the times it's busy, and there is an exit from the other houses onto Grassmere as well, and that's generally the problem right now. Okay, so how are we going to detail that then? In the um, I mean. I think the applicants in the room. I'll, if, this if, area, if, yeah, the applicants in the room. I'll get. I don't have a major problem with the white lining. Obviously, it's something that is separate to you know, obviously being reviewed. But uh, it's not a big showstopper as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, so, however you wish to add it. I mean, if it's something you wish to add, then obviously it could be added to be considered or you know, reviewed for the detail last stage or something added to be whatever you see fit. It's something you wish to include. Members, do we want that included at this stage tonight? That's, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, thank you. That appears as an informative one. Okay, thank you. Then my last one. Then what will we? Because you said the um, the, re the table ra the table crossing the raised bit have to be a separate process. So what would happen with those? Uh, I think with that, because it's, it's subject to a separate process, we can't link it to the application. We think we that it's taken away and looked at to be maybe in discussion with the board members to yeah. be included. Discussion with the board members and the parish council would be useful. Okay. Right. I think I'm there then. Hopefully, the committee is also there. We have the um, recommendation for approval set out on page, page 86 and then goes on with the conditions. We have the one additional condition in the members update. And tonight we have added the, the construction condition for the board members and the chair. We're having the informative for the um, clear ways to keep clear. And then for the table crossing, it's going to be discussed in association with the board members and the parish council. Is, are we all clear? Yes. All clear. Well, I've looked around there. So all those in favour, please go. Okay, that's all but one. Those I so. and require abstention. So thank you very much, members. That application is passed.
Moving on then, agenda item 43, which is on page 137, which is Emirates School. It's a full application for an artificial grass pitch with floodlights. It's before the committee it's been listed by Councillor Imogen Chevy de Bray and the applicant is WBC. The committee went on a site visit on Monday. The case officer is Katie Harrington. The right will hand over to you. And 
based on the goals towards the residential occupiers on either side. Um, the luminous will be zero, so there'll be no lights filled out at all. The assessment of whether this will be harmful or not is based upon the Institute of Lighting Engineers' kindness notes and such uh, would be acceptable in this respect. Uh, for clarity, the lights would be operating on time and we switched off uh, once the, um, after 10 p.m. on Monday to Friday or 8 p.m. Saturday, Sunday, back holidays. And the model lights didn't quite work, so they should, they should be lights at all on. Uh, concerns raised regarding the impact of the program. Um, this is related to the I think you sat a little bit, I know you've got a very yeah. quiet voice there, but if you sit further back from the microphone, it won't give us quite so much feedback. Okay, fine. So, concerns regarding, so the concerns regarding noise related to both the closed house in relation to the use and also people entering and exiting the site uh, before and after those uh, days of the proposed hours. Uh, the hours are so important for the function of the pitch. Um, the answer the pitch is tended for use for football at competitive and recreational levels and in order to use the pitch for a competitive level uh, football, football association football level, requires use of the pitch until 10 p.m. at night. And the pitch will also be used for mini soccer from 9 a.m. from 9 a.m. on the weekend. These are FA priorities. And the facility, in order to um, make the uh, skin viable, will need to be able to throughout the year. The officer's report sets out the technical um, technical noise information, which is fairly complicated. However, the, the, the Council's Environmental Health Officer has re reviewed the report, including the way that uh, the noise level has been modelled and um, the findings <coughs> presented, and have agreed with its findings, and set out that the level of noise disturbance would not be to the extent that it would be adversely harmful to the present community. Now, noise report includes two conditions. This first for um, the green isolating panels, so these stop that rattle you get on for sort of minutes. And the second is a noise management plan, and that will include uh, all inclusive groups signing up to a code of conduct um, to minimise noise disturbance on the pitch going to and from the, the pitches. Now, do you want to remember some? Discussion about other uh, pictures, other 3G pictures that were in the borough. Uh, these are some examples. Um, however, the hours uh, operation, the distance from residential occupiers are all varying between them. What this demonstrates is the need to consider the application on a side by side basis. So, again, as of any other application, this need to be held on its own merits. Um, also, during the member's side, there are some photographs of uh, the front lights in action. Um, and understandably, the lights feel diagrammed or difficult to um, visualise. So, this is the uh, Bernard Sport Pitch at Arborfield. The red line on this plan here is one box, and you can see the the focusing of the light here and the limited spill out from outside the pitch. The hours of the green hours of operation here is the 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. and, and uh, the week, during the weekend and the weekend finishing at night. And this is the example of a bias screen. Um, this, this, this demonstrates lots of five and you can see the amount of light spill coming off 
And again, the light is focused in the middle of the page. And for clarity, the nearest person to occupy here is 219 metres away, and the hours of operation during the week go up to 11 o'clock at night and 10 on Sunday. In terms of other factors, the council policy requires um, 30 parking spaces, that's 20 per pitch and 10 spaces for spectators. Um, the use of the 3G pitch will be able to use the school's existing car parks and they have 176 bays, so there's sufficient parking. And as I, said, as I mentioned earlier, the light spill has been, um, the light spill has been amended, so not to affect uh, the airbrook, and therefore we're about to have affected species. And in terms of flood risk, um, the council's drainage officer has reviewed the um, and has no, no objective, no objective condition um, for attenuation measures for the runoff. So in the members update, there is some, some more information about the maximum numbers permitted on the page. Um, this relates to the noise management plan, but this is um, subject to the condition anyway. As such, as the tenure officer support and in the members update, the proposal will comply with the urban plan and therefore will make recommended for approval. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I hope your voice improves. I know you've been, you've been struggling for a good few days now. Thank you. Right, the first person to speak is Kevin Morgan on behalf of Wokingham Town Council. Good evening to you. Thank you. Good evening, members. Um, I'll try and make this as brief as possible because I know you had a busy evening. Um, the main objection to this application, as it stands, is the hours of operation. As was seen from the presentation just now, the positioning of this development is a lot closer to it, residential properties than any of the other AGPs, but it's expected to have longer hours of operation than any of the other. So we, um, I would like respectfully ask that the hours of operation are, are reviewed a little bit more than that. It's, 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 it's just a publication for such long hours for an AGP. Um, the, 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 the number of users of this pitch, and I think this is referring to back in the papers here, is likely to be 22 active players at the maximum scenario at any one time. I'd just like to point out to members, 18 objections have been received to this. Okay. And that just gives a level of you know, a balance, I hope, uh, of what's been on. Now, I'd like to move on to noise assessment. The noise assessment that was done was based on uh, the noise created by one of these facilities at an open pitch in Bristol. Okay. Um, it took no account of ball catch fences, it took no account of spectators, it took no account of multiple matches being played at the same time, it took no account of spectators or noises of traffic. Um, the noise levels from the noise assessment that was published with this application indicated that the sound level of 50 decibels was likely to be sufficient to cause mild annoyance. Um, it quoted World Health Organization guidelines of 50 decibels as a level of likely to cause annoyance. However, recent publication, the publication of World Health Organization guidelines have reduced that figure from 35 decibels to 40. 35 to 40 as being a level of likely to cause annoyance. Okay, and I think that's something that needs to be considered here, that the noise assessment really doesn't seem to have been used to compare like for like. And now we want to the flood risk. The flood risk, um, and this is located on the flood plain. It is planned to drain all the water from it into the Embrook. Um, no account in the flood risk assessment seems to be taken into account that the Matthews Green development is also draining into the Embrook, a little bit further down the, uh, down the Embrook. The whole of the, uh, the, also the phase one drains into the Embrook. Okay. Uh, that does not seem to be accounted for. Finally, traffic, um, looking at the figures here, um, we are likely to have possibly 40 to 50 cars. The operation allows this thing 7 in the morning till 10 at night, 7 30 in the morning till 10 at night. Um, that means that this, uh, this pitch can be used during school time because of the opening hours. If it's used during school time for any activities, FA matches or whatever, um, I think we're going to have a problem. Okay. I would respectfully also request that, 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 that um, the, the, the interest of the local residents with all of this. Uh, the football development plan is not given a higher priority than the, uh, the residents. And the justification of this seems to be the football development plan 
Thank you much for your time, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker we have is Bob Miller. I do apologise if I got the surname wrong. Good evening, Jim. Good evening. Perhaps I should explain that I'm here on behalf of the Emirates Presidents Association. Do you want to start? Thank you. Perhaps I should thank you for allowing me the uh, late application to speak. We had to do this because our written application or our written response seems to have disappeared and hasn't been taken into consideration. So this is our only chance of uh, saying something. Thank you. Right. Although we accept the principal is constructing an AGP at the school, we do have serious concerns over the impact the extended hours of use would have on its neighbours. The main issue here is noise, and we highlight the following. The monitoring the noise predictions are based on was for training and short practice games only, and did not include any full competitive, full length competitive games as planned here. Experience has shown that these generate the most noise, both from players and spectators. Section 14 of the noise report states that all predictions are in, in any event subject to a degree of tolerance, but makes no attempt to qualify what this, tolerance, what this tolerance is. The modelling results are for ground floor levels only, and no figures are given for the first floor levels, where it is generally accepted they would be higher, and where the most noise sensitive rooms are located. The noise assessment plans to deal with the impact of sudden transient noise. The monitoring showed that this type of noise varies between 76 and 86 dB, and it is reasonable to assume that these levels would be even higher and more frequent competitive games. The applicant's noise management plan is of little value as it, as it is too vague, failing to define important parameters, and will be difficult to implement and, and police in practice. For example, there will be a nominated monitoring, a noise monitoring supervisor who regularly, regularly monitors activities on the facility. Will she or he be on site at all times the ATP is being used? How much noise is too much noise? How is the noise to be monitored? Is it purely subjective or is there some means of objective assessment to be provided? The maximum user capacity for the facility is not exceeded. Well, I now know that they have actually come out with some figures for this that they didn't have before. But I note again that it doesn't include spectators. And the spectators are there to cheer on their teams. Um, the five side uh, football teams are used for the youngsters. Are we going to tell the parents they can't go and watch their kids play football? Hardly. So we say that is very vague and not, uh, not up to scratch. In view of the foregoing, this the assertion that the modern noise of the general buildings would be below the WHO threshold by 1 dB is highly questionable. We therefore submit the applicant has failed to try to prove that the noise level would be within acceptable limits and that the proposal failed to conform with the National Planning Policy Framework, Noise Policy Statement for England, and the National Planning Practice Guidance for Noise. Finally, if the committee is minded to approve this application, it is requested that conditions are imposed to limit the number and timings of the noisier activities in order to minimise the harm to neighbouring dwellings. It is noted that this was done for the Emirates Sports and Social Club's approval, uh, approved application in 2015 to install floodlights and spectator facilities at the Vail Sports Green. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final um, speaker tonight on this application, Paul O'Neill, who's the applicant. Uh, you're, you're, okay, you're okay to be filmed now. Sorry. You're, you're okay to be filmed. Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Um, I should explain I'm the head teacher of the Inbrook School and I'm here, as I suggested, to support the application. Um, I'm here also to represent the benefits, as I see it, not just to the young people in my school, but the young people of all ages within the local community. We're very much a community school or a local authority school. Um, and we see immense benefits uh, to the young people in the local area if we have this state-of-the-art uh, sporting facility. The context that we're in is uh, a time when young people's physical and mental health is a national priority. We feel that uh, this kind of provision 
will be an exceptional opportunity for the young people of Wokingham to engage in really high quality uh, sporting activity, uh, the kind that they wouldn't necessarily get independently. I think the young people of Wokingham deserve much more than jumpers for goalposts in a park at night. And I think this uh, facility really will um, encourage and engage young people of all ages. The benefits for us as a school, and as I understand the usage, we will be uh, using it for the most part between 7.30 and 5 o'clock in the evening. So it's not just the um, increased PE curriculum that is enhanced by the quality and the range of activities we can take, that can take place on the school site on the 3G pitch, but also the breakfast clubs before school, the lunchtime clubs, the after school extracurricular clubs, and the work we do with our partner primary schools and the young people who go to them. We're very much a family school, it's one of our core values, and we are very much looking forward to the opportunities to inviting families onto our school site um, outside of school hours to engage in these kind of sporting activities. I talked briefly about the kind of physical and mental health as, as sort of national priorities. One of the things that I think uh, this uh, facility will give a uh, real opportunity, and I think it addresses some of the issues and concerns around um, the nighttime use of, of the facility, is the opportunity it will give for young people to take part in uh, competitive sports develop skills around teamwork, around leadership, around working in a safe space with an older or an adult who can mentor them and, uh, and coach them. Um, and I think it's going to be much more in our young people's interest to have those opportunities in the evenings and the weekends uh, than hanging around on, on street corners with the potential of, of antisocial behaviour or even more ironically sat in a room in their bedroom on a mobile device or a games console playing a football simulation. This is the opportunity to, to do the, the real thing, to engage in those activities. There are also many more opportunities outside of the school uh, in relationship with Reading, FC, uh, with the partner clubs. The demand is really significant. There isn't enough opportunity for young people to engage in, in football as a primary sport, but the other sports that are available here. Um, and I think it's going to be really important that we give young people access in the evenings and at the weekends, uh, as well as during the school day. <coughs> It has been, so one more sentence if you want to. As I say, I think I understand the residents, local residents' concerns. We want to work closely with local residents. Those local re residents, their children, their grandchildren, their students at our school. Um, and we feel that, they, that everyone will benefit from this facility. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. If you could just press the button so the light goes out. Okay, before I open it up to members, we just like the officers to come back on uh, those points that were raised. So the, the first one I took note of was the hours of operation. So we'd just like a little bit of clarification, because you did put up on the board other examples of um, times and how close they were to, to the houses, so if you could come back to us on that one. Then there was the noise assessment, and I'd especially like some comment about, it was, it was suggested that um, the noise has now been lowered to 35 to 40 for annoyance, down from 50. So if you could comment on that for us. There is the, the flood risk draining into the Embrook. Then we had the additional traffic. And it was mentioned by one of the presenters about um, the time the school has been used, but the applicant has since said that from 7.30 in the morning until 5, it will only be school children that are using it from that school, so there won't be any additional traffic from that. Um, we had the question how the noise will be monitored once it's up and running, if, it, if it's up and running. And the final point I've got is spectator numbers are not included in this um, table that you've produced, so I think be interested on that as well. In the first instance, do you mind if we refer to the environment? Oh, please, because so I was looking at that point. I think between Chris and I, we'll pick up on that. Uh, so uh, the first point with the um, the standards and the guidelines that the noise levels are being compared against, um, it has been compared against the 35 decibels, um, and I'm, I'm satisfied that they've correctly um, compared them against the right standards. So I'm happy with that. Um, the how is the noise being monitored? 
it <laughs> <laughs> wasn't approved. Afterwards, um, I don't think it is going to be. I don't think there's any proposal to monitor the noise levels afterwards, but the proposal is for a noise management plan to be in place, which will look at the um, activities on site and how they're managed. Yeah, so the crews will have to sign up to a code of conduct, um, which, will, which the details of which will be released, it's reserved by condition. So if they were to breach those, so the um, concerns of race, etc., should have been exactly noisy, whatever, then um, it will be up to the, the, those managing the pitch to um, enforce their code of conduct in their group. I think members would want to know how it's going to be monitored, the actual level, rather than just an opinion. I don't mean your opinion, I mean an opinion of the person that's there monitoring it. It's just going to say, oh, it's, it's okay, or not. I think um, noise complaints around these type of activities tend to be to do with antisocial behaviour. Um, it may be that they can hear um, some voices uh, from the pitch, um, but generally it, it, it wouldn't be sufficient to have a detrimental impact on the residents. Um, complaints tend to arise where there's offensive language or um, altercations, and that type of which you, you wouldn't necessarily need to do noise monitoring for, it's about management of the I'll leave that point for now, but I'm sure other members are going to come back to you on that. Um, so, so it was, it was in, uh, spectators and flooding. Yep, um, just because uh, just there was high risk, you mentioned. Um, I think you've obviously touched on the hours of operation. My understanding from the officers that looked at this um, on Harvey's behalf is that he is, as the headmaster mentioned, is for the operation of the school during the hours of 7.30 to 5.30 and then obviously thereafter it becomes accessible. So on that basis, uh, for our assessment, is that the car park is significantly off size to be able to accommodate the use of this pitch outside of the school hours. Um, and that's, that's the assessment we've taken. So in terms of traffic, we haven't got a problem with it. It's off peak and car parking is sufficiently uh, uh, conveyed on site. And in terms of drainage, the site has, it, it's, there's an FRA been submitted, been reviewed. Uh, there is the submission within that, obviously identifies the attenuation for a one in 100 year plus 40 year climate change. It's been identified that it's on a, a London clay, which has a, a kind of a low level of um, uh, filtration. And therefore, there's a condition. Condition seven, I believe it is. Eight, seven, eight has been submitted. So, so has been uh, has been uh, added, which will require some details of the filtration, etc., to be uh, approved prior to construction. So it's it's also it's only out of the Our number of spectators. <coughs> Right, so I don't have figures and number of spectators, um, but this area here is a spectator area. Um, this is so I don't think they're expecting large volumes of people watching. Plus, if you look at the light spill diagrams, it's going to be too dark for people to stand, for large groups of people to be standing outside watching. So I suspect. Um, the number of spectators would not be excessive. Okay, I'll open it up to members. Wayne, then Rochelle, and then Angus. Could we... Well, I understand what I'm saying about noise and antisocial behaviour, etc. Who will be managing this after five o'clock? That's my first question. Because, you know, I'm quite confident but the head will work with his neighbours. If we don't, you know, the neighbours will be getting onto the council and then you'll be involved in putting up machinery that will monitor levels of noise. What concerns me is post five o'clock, 
uh, and on a Saturday. So I, I fully understand what you say, Katie, in the evening, and you're quite right, it's probably going to use more for practice local football clubs, because there is a lack of them, and I'm actually sure it will get fully booked. But at the weekend, when it's active competition, you will get a lot of spectators. You will get a lot of parents coming to watch their children play football. So it comes back to my question. After five o'clock and at the weekend, who's in charge of this site? From what I understand, it will be an external management company that will be managing the sports pitch um, and that will be tied into the noise management plan. And just, just to confirm that the condition, the noise mitigation condition requires them to, to effectively set up a noise monitor and supervise and tell us who it is. Mm. What, what, what does that mean? You know? That mean, so if, if you ask for a, up after a specific person responsible for the site, I hope that there will be one. So there's somebody that will deal with complaints and liaise with environmental health if there are concerns from neighbours about noise. And it, it also means that sorry, they're, they're responsible for um, dealing with uh, clubs or individuals that aren't uh, playing by the rules as well. So if there is a, a team, for example, that are particularly noisy, then it, it's for that management um, structure to come in place to say that sorry to that team that no, sorry, you can't use this facility. Okay, so we've got me, I've got Angus, Rochelle, then Malcolm. Michelle. Oh, Rochelle, go then, Rochelle. No worries. Again, I would say the problem is going to be if there is active competition after 8 p.m., it's going to be a problem. Because if you've tried to knock on a door after 8 p.m. and not had your hand, head handed to you, uh, I would be very surprised if you're a member. Uh, I have no problem with the lights because it does seem to be okay. Uh, I would like to see that there be no competitive games after 8 p.m. and that only practice is allowed between 8 and 10. These practices are going to be less noisy. And before 8 p.m., well, most people usually put their children to sleep around 8, so that's probably okay. But before, it's going to be difficult. If you're saying you're going to have a noise monitor, is it going to be a number here? It's going to say, it happened, we have 30 dB at this hour, 31 dB at this hour, 40 dB at this hour. It's not going to be that. It's going to be, oh, I think they're yelling loud, or they're using nasty words when they uh, drop the ball, or they... Uh, hit them, hit the other person in the head with the ball or something like this. That's going to happen. But I'm trying to say, if you want competition, people will yell. They'll yell for their kids. They'll stand in the dark and yell for their kids. <laughs> I mean, realistically, if you've seen uh, parents of uh, sports teams uh, and gone to any football match on a weekend, you'll know they yell. <laughs> Can you restrict the uh, time to? Practice only at 8 p.m. Um, thanks. I, I think during the evening it's probably more likely to be adult games rather than, rather than kids' games or parents' then. But I, I think I, I understand what members are saying. I think noise is, is, a, is a valid concern. And um, actually, I think it's a reasonable suggestion to put forward for inclusion in that condition that it's not competitive games beyond 8 p.m. Yeah. I guess we. Thank you. Uh, I think it's great to see these uh, 3G pictures coming right across the borough uh, and they are proving to be uh, a, a great um, opportunity for, especially for the youth. And as the uh, head uh, has said, um, you see it's those benefits and you referred to Reading Football Club, their community trust, the amount of work they do with disadvantaged and people without the normal opportunities to get them out of whatever they were doing before and onto the pitch. So on that basis, I fully support this application. Uh, I don't think light or flooding is really a problem. Clearly, there is concern about noise. Um, all I'll say is all the other pitches that have been introduced are operating successfully and have management there which is working. If we don't do the restriction of 8 p.m. for um, competitive matches, my counter suggestion would be that there is built into the system a review after one year or, or 
Yes, I think probably to get a whole summer and a whole winter uh, to see the impact of this. Um, and that becomes a sort of a stopgap that if there is significant issues by the type of people, so we don't actually know who's going to use this between 8 and 10 at night. Um, I agree, it suggests it's probably going to be adults and it's probably not going to be competitive matches, but we don't know. So it might be better to, to leave it, but with a commitment to a review. Uh, Angus, then I've got Malcolm. Uh, Michael, myself, very similar to the previous speaker, really. Uh, these grounds we visited, uh, where they had to improve the grass or other facilities, are very valuable areas, and there is a need for them. We want people to keep fit and uh, do activities rather than just watch them on a screen or, or do some other activity. So uh, they're useful. Uh, the 3G bit adds to it as well. Uh, these fields are in fact used during the day for sport anyway, regardless of what the noise or the, the light is uh, during the day. Because if they weren't available, uh, we'd have sports in schools. So it is only generally in the, in the darker part of the day and later on that the issues are. Uh, it's noise, light and the timing. Um, the lights, I think, we've already established from other sites are very, very well controlled now. You don't get uh, spreading outside the area. So that need not be an issue. There is a possibility that noise would be quite uh, loud. I'm not sure I could tell the difference necessarily between active practice where there's people shouting and swearing at each other when <coughs> they do something wrong, or uh, a field where you're just um, cheering your, uh, your family members on. Uh, noise can be measured, but what are we suggesting? Are we going to have a machine there that measures it, and the moment it goes above a particular level and say, that's it, stop the game, go home, it's too noisy. It's not really practical, so I think I would go along with Angus's idea that um, we accept that these, we don't restrict the type of game, but that uh, we review at the end of the year to see how many, if any, complaints there have been about uh, noise or any of the other aspects. The other thing is that the lights go off at whatever the end day is, whether it's 9 or 10 o'clock, which means that most sensible uh, groups, knowing that, are not likely to be still on the field kicking the ball at 10 o'clock when it plunges into darkness. If you know the lights are all going off at 10, you'll probably stop playing at 9.30 anyway. So if you stop at 9, then stop at 8.30. Um, cars will be there uh, because people need to get to the games, whether it's day or night anyway. So uh, these areas are useful fields. I think we need more of them. Uh, it's a very useful uh, fitness facility. Uh, I would go along maybe, not necessarily reducing the hours, but simply reviewing it at the end of the year in what, if any, complaints have been made. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you, um, both of you. I think that the, there's a, a slight difficulty in that if you grant consent, you're granting consent with, that, with a condition on that restricts the hours, and you can't really put a real flexible hours condition on there saying if it goes badly then we stop at six, if it goes well we stop at ten. There, there is a potential way around it if you don't go with the suggestion about stopping competitive games at eight and you could effectively have a management plan for hours. So it's not a condition that says you shall stop at 10 p.m. It's a condition that says details of hours shall be approved by the local planning authority um, and in the first instance say we would approve the 12 month period at 10 p.m. see how it goes. Uh, with the review mechanism after 12 months to say if it doesn't go well and then complaints, then it reduces to, to, a later, uh, sorry, to an earlier time. Um, that does mean that there isn't a strict wording on, on a condition on a bit of paper, so it, it doesn't quite give you the same confidence as a resident. So it, it relies a bit on trust between ward members, chair, officers, that um, actually in 12 months' time something will happen. But I, I think it's workable as a, as a hours management plan condition. Is it on that point? Yeah. In particular, um, I agree with the idea of having sports pitches because it's a very good idea for everybody, but I still think it should be restricted. Uh, you can, if you want to do the restriction like that, but in the meantime, you will subject the local residents to having noise possible and problems with their children who you'd like to have them go to bed at a reasonable hour. And uh, also, I think it's just not a good idea to be on that, up that late doing sports right now, except doing something that's quieter. They're adults. They're adults. Okay, they're adults. But the thing is, it's going to be affecting all the residents around there. 
When they bought their houses, they expected noise during the day because it's school. At night, they don't expect noise really loud at 10 o'clock at night. I think that's too late. I think you're better off having the idea of having the management plan and try until 8 o'clock and see what happens, rather than trying until 10 o'clock and having them do it. If it is fine till 8 o'clock, that's good. If it's if it looks like it's working okay, you can go to nine o'clock. But if you change the hours with the with the borough people looking at it, Angus, is yours the same, or, you, or can I go to a new speaker? No, I just hopefully can finish this okay. one off. Um, I'm an optimist, uh, and I, I understand what Justin is saying about having wording which fits in with planning conditions, um, and I think that if complaints start coming in and teams know about it, they will reflect that because they don't want this facility taken away. So I would support, uh, as it were, amendment, amendment that Justin has proposed. Okay. Chris. Thank you. Um, a couple of points. Um, on the flooding issue where they can go to you, like you said, um, it was okay. I know uh, Councillor Morgan did mention the Matthews Green development. Does, has the full bill note of that been taken into account when assessing flood risk? Yeah, it has to. In terms of so the Greenville runoff rate, so in terms of Matthews Green, that completely, the Greenville runoff rate obviously runs off of that as a rebuild. Uh, due to obviously the development that's put in front of it, those rates that are identified calculated for the FRA approved need to be um, captured through the attenuation basins and released at that rate. So the attenuation basins are identified at one in 100 plus whatever percentage climate change was identified at that time was sufficient, um, similar to this scheme. Um, so the, the outfall into the Everett River or wherever it ends up in is at the rate that it should be managed and if it's approved to be managed at the outfall rate that was previously identified on that Greenfield site. Um, we're not supposed to encroach on other areas of the council with planning, and we do have environmental health. It, it seems to me that to reduce the hours and what's proposed is unnecessary, but if a sledgehammer to crack a nut, surely if there is a problem, environmental health can deal with it much more flexibly uh, than we can by having a stark condition placed on a reduction of hours and uh, decreeing what sort of people should play. Well. Certainly, that's the office of recommendations. Is that that 10 p.m. Then I completely agree that the environment is out there to um, to honour the issue. Michelle, did you have another point, or was it you just coming? I, I really, I would like to see that the hours be set by the borough, but I would like to try it different times and see what happens and see what the noise is, rather than saying 10 o'clock to start with, try nine or something like this. Try some compromise and see how it works for the residents. And if it does work well, and you want to go to 10, that's fine. But starting out at 10, and then waiting until they complain, unless they have Tony Johnson back there with his noise meters, can tell exactly how many decibels you have. <laughs> He's laughing in the background right now. But we won't know. And if somebody's yelling, and you say, oh, it's 46 decibels. Can you tell the difference between 35 and 46 decibels right off hand with your ears? Uh, I don't think so. So uh, I would say that based on what Kevin has said, and based on what other people have said, that we try to do something that's reasonable for local residents and reasonable for footballers. <coughs> Thank you. I think any, any other members wanting to ask me before I come back to this time? Carl. Just something I noticed when we were discussing times. Um, when you have this slide, I probably worth looking up again along with um, all the different other region pitches. I noticed it was one of the earliest things that said is, oh, we've got all the same all over the borough, but they're all very different. <laughs> really. The ones that seem very similar to this site is Arborfield, which is in Prepa, and Wayland's. And Arborfield is uh, obviously that's going to be very close to the centre. The district centre, so maybe the hours there doesn't matter too much if they're a little bit louder, a bit later. But um, the Wendell one seems quite close to it. Well, this is, I mean, the distance is even further on that, and that has a cut off at 9 p.m. 
and, and no public holidays. So uh, I'm not suggesting we do that, but it's just interesting that there's a difference there. Um, and maybe if we're looking for this compromise that Michelle's talking about, maybe we, we copy what we've done elsewhere. Just a thought. You, you, you may or may not have been on committee at the time, but I think that was um, a uh, member decision to reduce it from 10 pm to 9 pm. Mm -hmm. But actually, at, at the time, we didn't have that um, management uh, hours management condition before it was an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We did discuss that length on on wages. Okay. Wages was 9 pm. Yeah. Right. So before we come back on to this timing question, are there any more questions about anything else? Right, Justin, could you just reiterate to members then your suggestion? Yeah, but we're going to, that's what I'm going to ask. Members. Okay, so sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. so the, the, the recommendation that we have in front of you is, is the, the 10 pm condition as it stands. What, what you've discussed is a, um, an hours of use management plan uh, replacing that condition. And in effect, that can step up or step down. Um, over the period of time, depending on how well the facility is operating. So it, it could, for example, say 10 p.m. for 12 months monitored, and if it doesn't work during that period, it goes down. Uh, um, but that, as I say, that, that relies on um, on monitoring and um, feedback from residents to the to health and to officers. I look to you first, Angus, because I'm thinking that, that you sort of proposed, supported it. For clarity, as far as I'm concerned, I would accept a management plan and initiating it at the currently officer recommendation of 10pm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was actually proposed 9pm of Well, that's second Angus's. Okay. Right, so we've had Angus propose it and we've had <coughs> Malcolm second it. So we've, as we have that on the table, so th this would be put in as. Is this an informal? This is a condition. That'd be an alternative condition. So, it's a condition number five. An alternative to yeah. condition five. Okay. So, let's sorry, an alternative to condition three. So, remember. Sorry, but my mistake. It's an alternative condition to the um, out of operation condition three. So, members, are we clear what Angus has proposed and Malcolm is second to have a vote on? So all in favour of adding that condition then, please show. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Those against, three. So that condition would be added. So now then we need to vote on the application itself. Am I correct? I'm just looking at Mary to give me the nod. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, with condition three. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. That four, is it? Yes, because it didn't happen on the second, and we've had a proposal that was seconded. And that, oh, we had a proposal that was proposed, we had it seconded, but in the meantime, Michelle put forward another proposal, but Angus's one was seconded, so we had to take a vote on that. So that was carried. That's carried, that's contradicting. That, yeah. that, there's no point having so, yeah. Michelle. Maybe Michelle go first, maybe that would have won. But it, it didn't. The, the rule is that you take the first. Oh, let's everyone here, please. Mary. Sorry. So you're looking at this first. Yeah. So. <laughs> so the first proposal goes first on the vote. Unfortunately, so the, the, I mean, I'm presuming then that if you were first, it would fail. So. Yeah. Well, you don't know. No, but. Um, first one goes first. It, it, it contradicts your. Um, I say, so, Michelle, you're right, I did go to Angus first, then you suggested one, and then Malcolm straight in went on for a second in before anybody else could second. So once he'd seconded it, I couldn't say I didn't hear him second it. I had to... Cross the Rubicon. Yes. Thank you. Right. Let's get on to, to the vote then. The recommendation is set out on page 138 for approval with the recommendations. There's the amendment to... Hours of operation, condition three, which we voted on, and there are some additional ones in the um, members' update, in particular condition five. So all those in favour, please show. And we have two, three, four, five, six, seven in favour, so that's passed. Those against, and, and one abstention. So thank you very much, members. That application is passed.
If we could clear the room, please, um, if you're not here for the final application, um, we do want to go home as well. So, if you could leave, please. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, I've asked politely, could you leave the room if you're not here for the last application? Application for Vary Condition 2 of the Planning Commission 161596 for a park and ride facility for approximately 277 vehicles. It's the before the committee is a major application and the WBC is the applicant. Um, so for the original application, we did have a, a site visit and members will be familiar with the, the site as we recently went on a site visit for the MRT application, which was um, very close to it. And members did have a briefing on Monday about this application. And now I hand over to the case officer, which is once again Katie Hanley. Thank you, Chairman. Well, just to recap, this is the application site. I stand by the red, and it looks off the um, Thames Valley Park Drive around it. And then so just going to quickly go through how this proposal varies from the original. And um, again, this is section 73, um, so only bits of what's been approved are amended. In this instance, it's um, this has been approved. Proposal removes this um, bus stop and turning area, and by doing so, retains the trees. Um, the bus stops are now located over here and also retains more of the garden camping area of the uh, Waterside Centre. The proposal is a reduction of 19 park spaces and uh, retaining all the divides. So, so the regional scheme which is here is to um, basically the soil out ground here um, however, from um, some investigations carried out um, post the post approval of the original application, they found the gas pipeline to be quite close to the surface here, running through the site, and it's just not possible to um, um, to uh, escape this the escape the escape this area um, because of the position of the gas pipeline, and that's why the bus spades were the bar removed. Uh, more into the site as a result. This area here, uh, the trees, etc., is all retained. Um, the proposal will change the land levels, so the land levels here are behind trees, won't be changing. But um, the regional proposal sought to uh, excavate this area and have the car parking at a lower level because of the gas pipeline and cars. Uh, there is a need to um, put a retaining wall up here and fill in this area so it means preventing land levels uh, in order to accommodate the parking. So this is these plans are including the packs, but essentially it's demonstrating the existing land levels and the height of retaining wall. The retaining wall here is 3.7 metres. And it's about me just over a meter which is half from the table wall and the um, factory fence. And as you can see, as you go through the site, the table wall reduces in height. Um, the clarity of the land levels towards the river aren't a proposed to change for what's already been approved, been approved. Again, this is a section from the site through the access. And you can see that the table wall is 
large to the front, what you do is, as you go through the sides, and here you see it's the 10 more in the corner, and it reduces the height towards the praline man levels towards the river. This is the um, full size centre. In terms of impact upon character, um, the uh, proposed wall, the tailing wall, will be visible mainly from the Thames Valley Park, roundabouts. And again, the land levels towards the park changing, so there's no change there. And given position towards our centre, it's not really good, not really good to see it. Um, the treatment of the wall is, is addressed by a condition, however, it proposed to use a green wall, so these are some examples to help soften it along with landscaping. And they do draw from the existing uh, Tent Valley Park signage, which is since then having around about four metres in height anyway. And this is just an image of the uh, retaining wall towards the river, again, it should demonstrate the stilts and that height. Okay, the parish has, comment, has made comments on these and the members' updates. Uh, just reiterate, there's a section of the application which changes the land levels of the sites um, and changes the land of the bus bays and parking and results in the production of the parking spaces. All other matters have approval and, uh, and those matters are not based on approvals or again have approval. And uh, this application for recommended approval, subject conditions, etc. Um, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Right, we only have the one speaker for this, and it's Michael Fermager from Early Town Council. Welcome, Michael. Sorry it's so late. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm still awake. Good, absolutely. I'm trying to get further away. It's nice to be back, although if I'm only just visiting today. Okay. I'm actually speaking to you as Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee on Early Town Council. I know you've already had membership updates on this. Um, Early Town Council has requested refusal of the original application, which was numbered 161596, and following refusal of the MRT, considered that this scheme was no longer vital to the area and would in fact attract further cars into and through early. Early Town Council has considered that this proposal may possibly reduce traffic entering the Borough of Reading, but would not be a benefit to early. Early Town Council has noted that the documentation provided with this particular application, but observed the difficulties in formulating a picture of a new design of the parking area in relation to the wall. It appears that the high wall may result in dark areas of the car park, needing further lighting and thus having a negative impact on the ecology of the area. The imposing height of the proposed wall would also have a detrimental visual, visual effect uh, and, and really make it um, an unsafe area. For these reasons, early town councils request that the application be refused. Thank you. Very short. Thank you. Much, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I thought we might say that. Oh, if we could have a comment then on the um, height of the wall, dark areas and safety, see the, um, the comment about attracting more cars you've already Okay, so regarding the height of the wall, um, so the wall won't be for the car park itself. Um, it's retaining, retaining the car park at the top, so you want to have this the, the retaining wall and so the parapet wall and the um, balustrade, the safety barrier. We only get one, about 1.5. So you're not going to have any dark areas within the car park itself. And um, adjacent to the uh, retaining wall here, um, given nature side I don't consider that this will result in um, shadowing to the extent that it will be um, great dark places, etc. And bear in mind that that's the the, the height of the wall is only really on that corner. It's not been a car park itself. Um, in terms of in terms of the MRT, this is a separate scheme for the MRT and should be treated as such. Um, this can operate without any limits. Um, you noted that the 
obviously the only changing conditions is well, is number two, and then other conditions have been removed from the previous application. So no changes in the members update. So all those in favour, please show. And that's that's the majority. So those against. One against. Uh, the application is approved. Thank you very much, members. That's all the applications for tonight. Thank you.